Hello, and welcome to what will be a even more chatty live than normal, because this is supposed. Uh, this is both a patron and, to an extent, a brew ships combined, because that's what really suits this topic. Amphibious to ship developments from the 1980s to the modern day. Because, well, honestly, what have developments been from 1980 till modern day? Nothing much, really. Which sounds rather cruel, but let me explain it. The reason I say nothing much is that there have been no real new ship types. There have been nothing, no new ship types. There has been... A sort of a split, which I'm going to be discussing, between the major powers, what you call the big names, and the non-major powers. I think in terms of mainly due to a reality of the scenario they're dealing with. And that's such... I'm doing something slightly different. I'm not going to be putting up traditional or my normal traditional slides. In fact, what I'm going to do is have some slides running in the background. And make sure that starts off on the right page. And yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to be doing this while having these slides running in the background and pictures. And just sort of giving you an idea of what I'm talking about in a way. So, it's time to say hello to everyone. Hello, Peter Dawson. Hello, Calvin Aspect. Hello, John Shea. Hello, Francis Fado. Hello, Greg Satowski. Hello, Team Aloka. Hello, Derp Squad. Oh, my good Lord. The screen's in the way of the screen. That's what a fun thing to say. Hello, Albert Zasky. Hello, Rick Vasava. Hello, Sean V. Hello, hello, Stafford Thompson. Hello, DGV40. Hello, Effenhund. Hello, Greg Sadowski. I think I said hello to Greg, but hello again. Hello, Rowan Cash. Good evening. Praise be, I will have to leave at 7 pm. That's slightly worrying. And Please, can we just put a note for future references? I'm just going to say this in case anyone from the very religious people that occasionally complain to Twitter, uh, Twitter on YouTube or watching, um, they're not saying praise be to me. I'm not a religious leader. They're, they are doing a long-running joke about the Blackburn Blackburn. Please, whoever it is who's writing letters to my university, stop. Doesn't need isn't needed. Um mm. Hello Frank Sorry. Cal, will the fluke plane the zero counter suck? <laughs> oh no. Oi, Karama. There we go. All right then. I don't know, sounds like time to move to OBS. It's tempting, but XSplit tends to work quite well for me. We do have sound. Did Belfast visit go well? The Belfast visit did go very well. It was a lot of fun. Hello, Yikas. Hello, Andres Galado Garcia. Hello. Hello, Ian Stradling. Hello, Dejan Gorovic. Um. Hello, Felix B. Hello, do, 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 do. anyone on? Um, anyone else? Hello, Paul Beswick. And hello, everyone. Right. Seneca Nero, that must be fun to explain to the admin staff. It took a little while. Eventually, they realized the reason I, what I was talking about and the started laughing. But yeah, it was an interesting experience. I hope they've only done the one university. I hope they haven't gone around all of them. So, I'll just finish off my milkshake and then I'll open up some iron brew. So, um... 
Uh, Stafford, we uh, look. I am probably the. This is the one house in the world where we never use Karen as that joke for that phraseology, mainly because my sister is Karen. Uh, literally, that's her name. So that joke is uh, that joke uh, or meme or discussion or uh, aphorism or various point is um, the bottom. <laughs> Hannah Nick orders. Uh, I'm probably going to go for Limited Company Dirt Squad. I think that. I mean, charity has attract attractiveness, but it um, gets complicated. And no, I'm not doing the religious organization. Yes, Rick. There are people who have obviously far too much time on their hands. So, amphibious shipping, amphibious warfare. When you talk about amphibious shipping, we have to talk about amphibious warfare because, frankly, the two go hand in hand. One is built to do the other. One is uh, one is therefore a representation of what the people envisage the other being. And this is World War One. This is Anzac. This is the landings. Well, I think this is the practice of the landings myself, uh, and various other things that went on in World War One. Boats, not specialised. They're all sort of going on there. And the troops are... To an extent, I, that there isn't really much organisation going and getting on about getting those troops off the beach. Frankly, in compared to modern terms and compared to Napoleonic terms, there are... If that was milling around on a beach, a beach master would be having kittens. I mean, literally, there would be a naval officer at some point along that beach staring at an army officer going, And you set up your tents there? The well, army officer probably going, Well, it was flat ground. You set up your tents on the beach in my area? At which point the army officer is probably going, I didn't realize the naval officers and you know went in that many vowels. In 35 minutes, I'm watching this from inside an amphibious vehicle, a BDR, uh, BRDM2. Cool. Did I have fun in Belfast? Yikas, you, I did. I met a lot of cool people there. Some of them I can even remember the name of. And, um, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Oh, you don't start with the Greeks. I'm not starting with the Greeks this time. No. So, here is my problem with quite a lot of the modern amphibious doctrine you hear about whenever you turn on the television and people are talking about the latest fab. The minimum requirement, I think, for any amphibious force, if it's landed, is that it should be able to fight a T-55. Now, I have a reason for this. Because, as of last last description, there were somewhere in the region of 86,000 to 100,000 plus of these vehicles worldwide. Operators include Abkhazia, Afghanistan, Algeria, Angola, Bosnia Herzegovina, Cambodia, Central African Republic, Chad, China, Congo, Brazil, Congo, Kishina, Kinasha, Kinshasa, Cuba, Egypt, Equatorial Guinea, and three Eritrea, Ethiopia, um, including the Tigray Defense Forces, Finland at one point. Not sure what they've done with all theirs, but they've probably still got them going around, running around some of the fins. Um, Georgia, Guinea, Iran, Iraq, Ivory Coast, Kurdistan, Laos, Latvia, Lebanon, Libya, Mali, Mauritania, Mongolia, Mozambique, Myanmar, Nicaragua, Nigeria, North Korea, Novorossiya, uh, which maintained one. 
apparently. Pakistan, to Peru, Romania, Rwanda, Serbia, Slovenia, Somalia, Somaliland, South Ossetia, South Sudan, Sudan, um, Syria, Tanzania, Togo, Uganda, Uruguay, Uzbekistan, Vietnam, Yemen, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. And that's just the current operator list. The former operator list goes on even further. And the South Africans operate some Polish built versions of them. Just for the hell of it, I presume. And the trouble is, whenever you say T-55, this is what most people think. This is what a modern T-55 looks like. It, it, this particular model um, belongs to the Sri Lankan Armed Forces. And the Sri Lankan T-55s are pretty much a modern battlefield hot rod. They seem to have components from Western, Eastern, any source they can get the best version they can afford. So that is nowhere near like the old version on T-55. Eagle-eyed amongst you will have almost immediately noticed the suspension is different. So these are not your average vehicles to be fighting, but they are your average vehicles to be fighting. Oh, I've got a milk line on top. Um, if you can't fight them, there's no point in turning up. Whether you're a parachutist, amphibious warfare specialist, whatever. The odds are, if you go anywhere, lumber around anywhere in the world, if you come across a tank, it's probably going to be one of these. The next nightmare up is the variations on the T-72, which are slightly less common, but they're also everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so, when I am imagine uh, when I am examining modern amphibious warfare and modern warfare. I always look at it in the point of view of what are you most likely to find fighting? Because there is peer on peer amphibious warfare, which we talk about a lot in life, but um, let's be honest, if it happens, it's going to be, require a lot more ships than even the Americans or the Chinese are building into service. Because peer on peer is going to be quite massive. It's going to have to be. It's either going to be covert small raids, in which case it's going to be using submarines, as long as the submarine stealth factor holds. That's the discussion that's coming in bilge pumps. Or it's going to have to be quite massive. 100,000 plus of these tanks, D55. Peter Dawson, did you say the tent was above or below the high water mark? It was the army. We're never quite sure. That's fine. I think we should write it. <laughs> no one needs to write in there, sourced, but they were a bit surprised. Off license, it puzzles me that landing craft hovercraft numbers are being reduced for more helicopters. No more heavy lifter beaches. I'm getting to that. I'm going to be getting to that. Ah, uh, Nick Waters, we've just witnessed the reenactment of some form of an officer's communication style. Ah, uh, former? Former? Mm hmm. <laughs> Rolling cash? I'm not repeating that. And some of those tanks have a made in Poland placard from when we actually could produce tanks there. Yep. 
Frank's on. Are watching the country song now. <laughs> uh, Team Maloka. AA and bridge laying in the finish use. Yes, they have all sorts of variants on T55. Please. This is one of the most ubiquitous vehicles in the world. Okay? There are more versions of this vehicle than there are some popular cars. In, uh, there was also an interesting thing on a... Maybe, maybe in an interesting portion of the internet, you could actually buy one of these for the price of my Subaru. And that was, of course, not including delivering it and getting it sent to my home. And I might have, for a few minutes, actually entertained the idea of having a T-55. It was one of the variants without a big gun on. It's just the AA variant, so mainly just some anti-aircraft cannon. Uh, for my commute to work, but I decided it probably wouldn't be get that good a mileage to the gallon. That's good. If your enemy doesn't have tanks, then a T-55 will give you a level tactical op options your enemy will struggle to match. Pretty much. <laughs> Those countries who do uh, do uh, not, do not operate T-54 or 54, 55, 70, have a significant amount of them in private collections and museums. Oh, yes. There is reportedly even a fair number of uh, mercenary organizations which may or may not turn up with variations on T-55s for a party. But this is the point is, amphibious warfare therefore is an opportunity because you can take heavy equipment with you. The trouble is, it seems to be, especially if we're looking at modern militaries, and when I'm talking about the westernized modern militaries, they keep thinking lighter and lighter and lighter. Now, this has caused some interesting uh, occurrences to happen. For example, this is the uh, this is a variation on the Italian San Giorgio class. This is the Algerian Colette Beni Abbas. And for those wondering, well. She displaces, displaces roughly 8,800 tons. She has a top speed of 20 knots or can do 7,000 nautical miles at 15 knots. She has a crew of roughly 152 and can carry 438 Well, how to put this? 438, uh, 450 soldiers, more than that, likely. Um, she has her own Acer radar. Well, it's a Leonardo from Maggio, but it's an Acer, a 3D Acer radar. And she has an Otto Malaria 76mm, two Otto 25mm, and carries an 8-cell Silver A50 VLS for Asta 15 and 30, missile, uh, 30 missiles. <laughs> she can apparently also be upgraded to have more of those. Um, she has a hangar for recovery uh, for Super Lynx helicopters. But she can ha carry free uh, transport, uh, free Merlin transport helicopters, well, A101s, or Superlinks. <laughs> now, here is the thing she carries. Free landing craft, as you can see. She carries a lot of equipment. She's actually assisted by um, free other craft. Look those little free landing craft. And the whole point is 
She's been built to be for a quite a small power, Algeria, and let's say in military terms, in expeditionary military terms, they're expeditionary military. And let's consider that Algeria has decided that they need amphibious warfare capability. And this was launched in 2014. She was ordered in 2011. So since 2010, they have decided they needed this, they've ordered it, they've built it. And they have a capability which has a decent radar, a light frigate's level of air defense missiles, and the ability to deploy half battalion of troops. That for Algeria is a major capability. And they can go with tanks, because she can carry 15 tanks. <laughs> she also has a 60 bed hospital with operating theatres. This is a fundamentally a very useful ship. And the point I'm trying to make is that since 1980, more and more amphibious warfare capability has started spreading down. <laughs> uh, so, what are there more of? Honda Civics or T-55s? I think the Honda Civic just about wins that one. But not by, not by as much as you probably think. Um, Nick Wallace, yeah, Hot Rod seems a good way to describe current ones. The Iraqi one in Bovington, they called the, uh, uh, they called the Enigma, looked novel. I would say most T-55s currently still in service, very few are what we would call factory examples. And this is a very great, a good capability. And this is the sort of thing which quite a lot of nations are looking for in their amphibious warfare forces. They're looking for the capability where they can have the capability they need. Where they can have something on a budget which gives them firepower. And what is really interesting, perhaps, about this ship is that it's not just on her own. They also have a couple of landing ships, which were in 1984 commissioned from Britain. Um, I can't find any photos of those, but they're the Khaled Beni uh, Muhammad, uh, Hamad and the Khaled Beni Rashid. And they look perfectly capable. This is a not a massive navy there. Frigates are Miko A200s. They're um, Adverch class, which are Chinese vessels. And they have Kony class vessels. And we're talking, the Mikos are the biggest at 3,700 tons. We're talking 2, 000, roughly 2,880 tons for the Adva class and 2,000 tons for the Konis. Algeria is not a massive navy. And yet, that ship is critical. On the other end of the spectrum, you, of course, have the Canberra class. Now, the thing is, the San Giorgio, the San Giorgio design that Calat Ben Arabes is based off is a dock ship. They do have docks. They do have the capability to load up ships through them. And one of the interesting things is if we were talking about the Italian ones, we'd be talking about something which could carry 36 armored vehicles. The Canberra class are, of course, designed for the Australians. They're an adaption of the Spanish vessel. The Juan Carlos. And I would have to say that they, I would almost call this their prettiest angle. But they're able to carry 
up to 110 vehicles on both a heavy vehicle deck and a light vehicle deck. Capable of taking 1,600 troops in overload, or very nearly two battalions worth, to travel 9,000 nautical miles at 15 knots, and carry a crew of roughly 360 personnel. But, and here is my issue with this, because it displaces 27,500 tons at full load. It has a giraffe AMB radar and a sub combat system. Okay, fine. But it only has Raphael Typhoon 25mm remote weapon stations. And this is a trouble which I see with some of those navies. If we consider you go to the San, uh, the previous one, she had silver VLS, as I said. The equivalent of really a small frigate. In terms of firepower and protective firepower. In comparison, this one, which is three times her size, can, as a result of being three times her size, carry... Mm, about seven and a half times her number of vehicles. Very useful. And nearly four times her number of troops. But this one needs an escort. If you're sending any of this one anywhere near a threat zone, she needs an escort. And that is not unusual, because if you think about it from the Australian perspective, they would presume if there was anything bad enough that required this one going into a hot zone, they would be able, there would be an escort there to be provided. The Algerians, who don't consider themselves quite as big as scary as the Australians consider themselves, go, well, hang on, we could send our ship to somewhere we think safe, and it could turn bad, so we better have cover for it. Plus, we only really have the Mikos, which are the really reliable ships. Greetings, Delta, Delta Filipino. Hello, Richard. <laughs> Civics by a lot. There are more T-55s than Ferrari and Lamborghini have produced in the uh, combined since they were founded, not including Lamborghini tractors. Lamborghini tractors are disturbingly popular. Uh, Stubbs got T55 would cost a lot more to run than your Subaru though. I imagine that the vehicle exercise duty would be significant and local borough might be upset about road damage. I'm a former borough councillor. They would be upset, yes, but having met my local council, I feel that my T55 would persuade them that they had better things to do than interview with me that day. I'm, I'm sure they would find a way to interfere, uh, to decide they couldn't. And, yes, as you point out, Carl and Gathbert, I don't have to waste time on waiting in traffic jams. Rick Vassar, Carl, uh, Carl Gustav will take out any tank if you are close enough. That's the trouble, if you are close enough. Alfred B228, I was always amused when we would do training exercises in the first LAR and they would paint the sensor that our company had to hold back a company of T55, uh, paint the sensor that a company had to hold back a company of T55s with. Uh, only two anti tank LAVs, the rest being LAV25s. That doesn't really surprise me. Dev Squad, is the bow deck gun off the center or raise, on a raised platform? It's slightly off center. So that the aircraft can get free. Frank Smart, 
Look to see. Is a hybrid battleship LHD a bad idea? Honestly, that actually might work better. It's when you want to have fast wing or fixed wing aircraft operations. That's when that and guns become a problem. And honestly, when missiles become a problem as well with fodding. But you can get around that if you're prepared to put them out on sponsors enough. Old oh, Richard, isn't a post over the beach landing against a near peer adversary still a viable option in 2021, giving Western aversion to casualties? Uh, not American style. British style, maybe. Not American style. I.e., British style is find a beach where the enemy isn't and then turn up there. <laughs> Take care, uh, Ron Cash. I was like, a 76mm on a landing ship? Or one, on one hand, it could provide artillery support. On the other, do you really need want to be within gun range of the shore, especially if it's an RN ship? <sighs> I'd say the 76mm is also quite a good closing weapon system for a modern day procurement. Frank Spider, why did they buy them from Italy? Because Italy produced very good ships. This is the other thing which you've got, and when you're talk, talking about land and craft and talking about ships, this is the vessel. It's a Mark IV landing craft, and it's one of the ones operated by the Indian Navy. It's 63 meters long, a leather, uh, with a beam of 11 meters and a draft of roughly 2.2 meters. It displaces around 830 tons. It's an LCU, and well, it has a range of 1,500 nautical miles at 12 knots. It can carry 160 troops, or a couple of tanks. Well, a bit more than a couple of tanks if he wants to, as you'll see in a picture soon. But does that does start to expect, affect its range? It has two thirty millimeter cannon, uh, some twelve point seven machine guns, and uh, seven six two machine guns, and Igler man portable surface to air missiles. All on this little thing. And the interesting thing about it is the Indian Navy bought eight of these Mark IVs. They replaced the three, uh, the four, or they replaced the four Mark III's in service, which themselves had replaced the Mark II's. This is the uh, this is the Indian Navy's evolution. They have bigger ships, they have more powerful ships, and they have better, larger amphibious ships than this. But they do maintain these eight vessels, and that's quite useful for them because they're thinking in terms of island hopping operations and dealing with islands in the Nicobar and that, that sort of area of the of the uh, the Indian Ocean. In which case, that sounds rather like some of the American scenarios, which are currently cooking into various expensive vessels being looked at. And trust me, this is not that expensive, because... Well, it was bought... <laughs> for the equivalent... of, well, the whole program seems to have had the equivalent of roughly 500 million US dollars, although there does seem to be a debate as whether, I don't think that's for the individual. Uh, that is, for I think, for the hot or late. So each one individually comes in at roughly 60... Two and a half million dollars, or current exchange rates, forty-six and a half million pounds per unit. Yeah. 
Right then, uh, let's see. Come on, guys, the re T55 factory, Asana. Facing it, that and a commercial hunt uh, hunting night vision scope cost less than 100 millimeter shell. Hmm. Oh, uh, Resan Dorgio Farpar. Having a decent self defense anti air anti missile suite, and that 76mm Volcano are just plain HE, can give some naval gunfire support. It means it's sort of self supporting to an extent. That's good. If a country wanted to surprise an enemy with a small uh, with a sneak landing, could a modern car carrier bring e equivalent uh, equipment to hold the port until reinforcements arrive to expand the beach? It probably could do. Which is why you probably want to watch any car carriers which turn up in your country from unexpectedly, or even expected ones. I was asking, you could we say that the San Giorgio is designed to operate independently? I'd say relatively independently. I wouldn't want to operate in a submarine environment. Um, although it can carry five helicopters, so I suppose one of those could be an ASW helicopter. Or rolled as such. And thus, it's good for small navies that can't form an amphibious task group. To an extent, yeah. Hmm. <laughs> Potentially, Derp Squad. <laughs> good luck, Stafford. Stay safe with the beam st uh, beam placement, please. Yeah, this topic will probably be addressed, but in accordance with the, the photo, small LSTs and LCTs seem losing to big floating box LHDs. Reason for this? Okay, well, the thing is, the smaller ones are losing out in terms of the race of the bigger navies. It's so like we'll be, uh, we're a finish off by discussing the amphibious ready groups and the literal response groups of the British and the US navies and looking at their futures. And then we'll go into a regular brew ships chat at questions until I run out of iron brew or until I fall asleep, which I, I, I think you'll be running out of iron brew first. First, I don't think you'll be falling asleep first. Uh, I've been up quite a few hours. Doggy was not that one of the fluffy research assistants to Tafra. His, his jaw's just setting at the moment. Corgi's there. Jaw takes quite a while to, to grow in, and his was delayed because he was ill at a certain point, so he was on quite heavy drugs. And so he was up quite a lot last night. So I was up quite a lot last night. And then, of course, no sleeping in. I had to be up in London. 10 a.m., which on a Sunday is no mean feat, and ended up being up there for. Quarter past nine. Oh, it was fun. Me and Drak got to have a chat. Ah. <laughs> oh. uh, Don Giovanni, isn't the America style of a posed beach landing a helicopter assault followed by a landing? Um, that's to an extent what they're planning, but <sighs> the thing is, that is in many ways, the modern way. You put in aircraft. You use aircraft to get troops ashore, and you use the landing craft to get the heavy equipment ashore. And that's viable. Really. Unless you consider, well, what happens if you're facing a peer-level threat? What happens if you're facing an enemy who has a lot of man-portable anti-air weapon systems? What happens if you are having to fly over cities and people start firing up into the air with RPGs and machine guns? It's not saying it's not impossible. Please note, I, I don't want anyone going away and saying that Dr. Clark says it's impossible. And not. I'm saying you have to think these things through. And the end, learn it, learn, uh, in the end, when you're talking about amphibious operations, one of the things I interestingly someone said to me when it meant was, well, if we have to land this far away, giving a certain distance, then there's no point in conducting an amphibious operation. And I went, why? You just turn up in a vehicle and drive the rest away. Well, then we've lost the strategic, uh, we the element of strategic surprise. 
So you turn up with some battle tanks and you regain strategic surprise by blasting anything that gets in your way out the way. That's how you do it. That's the whole point of amphibious warfare. It's not like parish. It's not like airborne where you have to seize the airfield and then it's going to be very slow rowing up. You take everything with you so you can land it in one great big vroom. It's here. It's a strategic surprise more than a tactical surprise. And this is the trouble with amphibious warfare. A lot of people confuse strategic surprise for tactical surprise. It can be a strategic surprise where you land that you land with that amount of force. It might not be a tactical surprise by the time you reach me, because if you've landed 200 miles away, it might take you the best part of two days to get to me. But that doesn't mean I can do much about it in the meantime. I can't suddenly order a lot more tanks, especially if you've got aircraft and other systems which you're using to deny me air superiority. Please note I'm using the phrase deny me air superiority if I'm defending. I'm not saying claim air superiority. I'm talking about fighting under a disputed sky. Okay, now I remember the landing of the US in Somalia with the first Marine of uh, uh Bum. Uh, yeah, I know. I've tried to avoid Somalia, discussing Somalia too much. Hang on. Did the UK LPDs in the Falklands work as well as hoped? Was there any other that they would have wanted instead? They wouldn't have wanted really any other LPDs other than the ones they had at the time. They probably have quite liked the ones they built later, uh, the ones we built, you know, currently, and so is Bulwark and, uh, and uh, sort of um, Bulwark and Albion, because they'd have been much, much better command facilities-wise and far more useful vessels. But honestly, the thing they'd have most liked would be a slightly bigger command centre and better radios and probably a hangar, which they got two out of three of those wishes in the next class. I think if Frank, I think if Commodore Clapper had his way, he'd have quite liked an LHD of some kind, or HMS Ocean, because he'd have quite liked his helicopters to be on a ship under his command, so other people didn't keep using them for stuff. He was quite happy when he got them ashore. It managed to, it meant that he didn't have to keep looking up and going, Who's nicked one now? I'm trying to plan an amphibious assault and my number of helicopters keeps going down because my allies keep disintegrating them by sending them off on one-way missions. Mm-hmm. Now, for those wondering what the ship is next to me, that's just popped up. I was expecting a Macassar class, but it looks like hmm, might be a Macassar. It is. It's Banner Shemison. It is a it is a Macassar class landing platform shot dock. Vessel as built by South Korea for Indonesia, Philippines, Peru, Malaysia, Myanmar, and probably Brazil. Currently in service with the Indonesian, Philippine, and Peruvian and Myanmar navies. Uh, the Peruvian navy has offered one to um, Brazil. In exchange, uh, in exchange for two U two hundred nine Brazilian submarines, <laughs> which apparently the Brazilians agreed with, they are fairly capable. They can carry up to thirty three, inf uh, thirty five infantry fighting vehicles, three hundred fifty four troops, uh, but they have a complement of accommodation of up to five hundred and seven people. They have 126 crew. They have a Bofa 40 millimeter, two 20 millimeter Oricon, um, some Mistral Simbads. They have a two heli deck spot flight deck, no hangar, and they weigh in at roughly 12,000 tons. 
Oh. And they reportedly cost... Roughly, as said, $170 million. Although there have been discussions that some people might get them slightly cheap, might have got them slightly cheaper. We're not quite sure, but it seems to be a very sensible, fairly good and capable system for a lots of smaller navies. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to reorganize my screen because I think one of my troubles I haven't been seeing that coming and because I've kept flicking between the chat and that. Nick Waters, if you can choose eight of those or a far fewer, something more complicated, I can see the attraction. Those LC, LC, those um, LCUs, yeah, they're quite good. I was asking, we have a similar class of landing ship in the Polish Navy. All the same, all the same that the Indian Navy has uh, plus mine landing equipment. By the way, those uh, Ingla missiles, it's just a sailor standing with a stinger on a shoulder. I know, but it works. It's still something, it's still something they have. Oh, and this is the San Giorgio class, actually the last one built. This is the one, uh, this is what the Italians have in service, uh, the Italian example of that vessel, which um, I was shown at the beginning in the Algerians. And as I said, this one, they are 8,000 tons fully loaded. Uh, they have a top speed of 21 knots. They have a range of 7,500 miles at 16 knots. They carry 350 troops with 30 medium tanks or 36 tracked armoured vehicles. Uh, they have a crew of 180. They have... Flight deck, no mention of hangar on them. But they do have the ability to carry three uh, A101s and five Augusta Bells, or 18 SH-90As. They carry an Otto Breda 76mm gun, although this was removed from San Giorgio and San Marco to increase their flight deck space. And uh, two Otto Malera 25mm ones. San Giusto, which is the last of the three to be built, has a full load capacity, which is 300 tons greater than the rest of the other members of the class, which probably makes her full load roughly 8,100 tons, probably. They don't carry the... Uh, Asta 15 missiles. Again, it's the Italian Navy. They have they have frigates, etc., which carry enough of them. They don't worry. And currently, Qatar is ordering a vessel based like uh, something like this. And the Italian Navy is currently building their replacements for this class. The Italians' replacements are going to be roughly 21,000 to 24,000 tons. So, they're probably going to be building at least three of them. They are considering building the third without the docks facilities, kind of like a la America class, where some of them are built without the dock, so it can have increased aviation facilities. But the plan is to really grow their amphibious capability. Still. These have been popular. Um, that's good. I, I'll, I'd answer that. MV Estonia, ask me again when we're in the brew ship section.
Peter was like, Normandy was not Calais. No, it wasn't. And this is the point I keep I make to people when they start thinking about amphibious warfare and they keep going, oh, but you have to do this. You have to go straight in. And you're going, no, you don't. You really don't. And Fab, when does amphibious warfare transition to land warfare? Possession or construction report? Or amphibious warfare transfers to land warfare when the change of operational command is enacted. So. Technically, under NATO doctrine, what happens is there is, let's say, they're the British ones, and it's a full task group going in. So you have the Commodore, amphibious task group, in charge of all the ships. And you'd have <clears throat> the Brigadier of the Landing Force. And the Commodore of the amphibious task group would also have the rank and have the title of Commodore Amphibious Task Force. So they become two sides or two points of the triangle. They try and be friendly, but it's basically described as their primus into Paris. So this one, the land force, has input, but can be said the, uh, the amphibious task group commander, the RN officer, can say no. Can say. Ships can't go there. It's a naval operation, and ships can't do that. We can't do that. So you're going to have to come up with another plan. Now, when the landing force is landed, when they feel they have enough supplies ashore, and that they have enough... How do I put this? enough area under their control that they have safe and they have their artillery and all the other things, they can issue a CHOP request. Change of Operational Command. I, we go off and become the Land Task Force and you retain your role as the Sea Task Force. <laughs> Which normally is approved straight away and boom, this one is now free and it's now a land battle supported by the Navy. At which point the Commodore Amphibious Task Group or Amphibious Task Force, depending on what uh, what title or what should their titles you're giving them, then will either take his ships or her ship uh, their ships off and go and fight a battle somewhere else, do another amphibious operation. Or they might continue supporting, in which case they can change their title, will be could well be changed to Commodore Inshore Forces. It becomes fun. Right. Next one we have here is that is a Talak class landing platform dock, which also belongs to the Philippine Navy. And these weigh in at full load of 11,500 tons, carry two LCU, LCUs and some ribs, can carry 500 troops plus associated vehicles and equipment, have 121 crew, armed with a 76 millimeter, uh, 225 millimeters, so the gun fit of, of um, the a nice way, the gun fit of the first us we talked about. Have a hangar for one medium, that's a 10 ton helicopter, and flight deck for two 10 ton helicopters. It's a pretty cool capability. And if we consider it in the rest of it, the Philippine Navy has a very strong amphibious task force, really. And you can understand why if you look at their sort of their realities of their situation. When it comes to amphibious ships, they have, if we just go through them, they have Talat class and they have Basilid class logistic support vessels. They have various LSTs, which are used for some things. They have Tankuna, uh, Tankuna class landing craft utility. They have Ivdan class landing craft heavy. All sorts of things they have, and you can understand why being the Philippines. 
they need a range of amphibious capability. Oh, da -da -da -da. It's in front of Dirt Squad. Mm, there's lots of interesting stuff going on. Let's see. Uh, da -da -da -da. Nick Waters. Peru must want subs in a hurry. U209 is a fairly old thing these days. They're worried about things. They decided they needed some submarines. Uh, Poland had a twin 40mm Bopus AA mounted on a telescopic platform that got hidden in a pressurized compartment on the Orzol class subs during World War II. That's some heavy AA for the time. It is. That's good. Uh, Re Brazil, Peru uh, ship sub swap. Given that the designs of that Scorpion class submarines that were being built by Naval Group for Brazil were sold to various intelligence agencies from around the world by a Naval Group employee. I'm not surprised that the Brazilian Navy doesn't mind swapping a couple for a landing ship. They're coupling, uh, they're not uh, swapping those submarines. They're swapping submarines that are 209s, the German built ones. Uh, but they're not swapping the Scorpions. Next one, look at your opinion on the Kiwi LPD. Uh, it's nice for the Kiwis. It's very capable. But it's again, they only have one. And as we all know, one. Uh, uh, one is none. Two is virtually. Two is anything happens none. So if you're having less than three, you're not being really serious. You know that was why Britain was okay for a while because it had an LH, it had an LHP and two LPDs, so it had three amphibious ships. So it was being serious. Although, and thankfully, it had three four bay class, mm, three until it four until it sold one to the Australians as the jewels. In which case, that was also quite serious, because that meant that it would normally have two of those available, at least least one of the amphib larger amphibious ships, and that was uh, roughly, well, probably an overload. You're probably talking around about 2,000 troops able to be transported, and you're definitely able to get landing craft L LCUs there, because the Bay class can take them, even if you don't have an LPD, and you've got your helicopters going there. Thanks for that. If carriers are committed, uh, are attached to and committed for amphibious ops, are they considered an amphibious vessel? Uh, depends what their role is in the amphibious operation. If they are carrying troops and acting in the landing platform helicopter role, yes. If they are providing air defense from the sea and etc., then they're not. <laughs> That's good. And Reamphibious Command, uh, Operation Command, Land Commander, let's go deploy here. Naval Commander, let's go over this again. Blue bits of water, green bits of land, ships go in water. It, it's never that bad. Honestly, it's going to sound strange. You're often dealing with the fact that the Royal Marines and their equivalents are often uh, very much the professional, hardcore amphibious warfare specialists. So sometimes it's more the other way around. The naval officer could well come from a variety of different backgrounds, and they probably they've got they've had some reading on amphibious warfare, but it might not be they might not be a specialist. They might not have served on amphibious warfare ship before. They might not have had that experience before, and suddenly they're commodore. And yes, the Royal Navy likes to do a transition and some training and all these sorts of things, but you can very quickly find that your senior that the basically the brigadier is having to teach the naval officer about it. Because amphibious warfare is what Marines do. They do the, carry out the amphibious operations. They need a lot of training for it. I was, it was rather interesting. The other day I was watching an episode of SWAT on Netflix. And 
this person appointed by, I don't know, by the mayor uh, was coming in and said, oh, uh, well, you know, what the mayor's thinking about is that they've got these very expensive, very well-trained officers, and they're not doing anything proactive with them. They are spending their time training. You sit there and think, well, hang on, the reason SWAT, like Marines, train so much, even though they're not necessarily doing the deployments in those operations, is because what they do is incredibly difficult and incredibly demanding, and it requires the higher standards of them. And if they don't achieve those higher standards, then a lot of people can get hurt very badly. And you can get a lot more worse pre a bad press that way. But it's the, that's the same with amphibious warfare. You need these sorts of things to be well practiced, be very well drilled. And that's the, one of the advantages the, the British had in the Falklands War. They had been off in Norway doing an exercise. That's got time check, 9, 7.30. I know, I'm running about four minutes behind. Hmm. Frank Spanner, Dr. C, what do you think about a terror having five-inch gun in each corner of the flight deck when built? I think that was actually quite a good idea. I think that's quite useful myself. Gives them quite a versatile asset. The five-inch gun is quite a capable, quite a versatile asset. <laughs> Add fab. Given the time frames, are the Australian SSN plans for the time well, after the Taiwan has rejoined the motherland? I doubt it, but I do wonder. I don't know where. Uh, that's uh, that's a completely different topic. Um, but I do think with the Australian. My instinct for Australia and its SSN program, and this is my instinct, is they will probably lease Los Angeles boats off the States. But there isn't really any spare production capacity, and the American Congress does not like selling hulls. So I think they possibly buy astute ish hulls off the British, two of them. And those uh, those four vessels, and sort of considering the time they're taking to get into service and all those things, then see them into until they've got their own construction program going, and then they buy reactors, um, or reactor modules from either Britain or America for their new constructions. And I do wonder if they jump in on the SSNR program with the British, and maybe there's a fusion between the SSNX program and the SSNR program to an extent, in that maybe the Americans pursue their standards, but you share a lot, pool a lot of technology, it pools on the technology, and the British and Australians uh, keep their main, uh, keep their crewing standards and pursue to, uh, and share technology in procurement. <laughs> Off license, do these countries really need as much advanced amphibs? A few LSDs and some modern logistics ships um, uh, would cover the vast majority of contingencies. You would think so, but honestly, these ships tend to be building these level of amphibs because of the other facilities that come with them. It's the command and control, it's the communication facilities. If we consider this... The vessel. It is quite well armed. It is the endurance class landing platform dock of the Republic of Singapore and Royal Thai Navy. Its full load is roughly 8,500 tons. Notice the pattern turning up here. It has uh, Mistral missiles. Launch from two Simbad twin launcher mounts. It has an Otto Malera 76mm super rapid gun. It has two 25mm 
auto cannons, and it has four 12.7 machine guns. It has a flight deck and enclosed hangar for two medium lift helicopters, and it can carry up to 500 troops, plus 18 tanks, 20 more vehicles, and bulk cargo. And the Singapore Navy has four of these. <laughs> yeah. Singapore has four of those. And they've sold one to the Thai Navy. That's a lot of capability in 8,800 tons. It's useful, though. It's useful for Singapore because what do they do? Well, in peacetime, if someone nearby them has a disaster, if, let's say, the Philippines has a natural disaster, they can turn up with a lot of capability very quickly. Also, and this is the point for the Singapore, or Singaporeans to an extent, is they have to sort of think expeditionary. They don't have much in the way of space or water to trade if anything happens to them. So they have to provide a, be a useful force that goes around with allies so that their allies will come help them if they need help, their help in the future. That's the capability. Hmm. Thanks, Connor. Let me see. You should be saving your iron brew bottles in case they are they are made in China. If actually runs out, ah, uh, hopefully not. Hopefully that won't happen. We hope not. Discord. When you say Peru is worried about things, are those things known as the Chinese fishing fleet and their questionable quality maps of territorial limits? That's not what you usually use submarines for. That's what you use uh, various other more normally uh, known as APVs for, and actually what you might use something like this for, if you loaded up its dock with speedboats instead of um, landing craft. But what they are probably thinking about in the case of Peru is Venezuela. Everyone starts to worry when you have a neighbour who has a lot of military hardware and a very bad economy. So, Thompson, do you foresee the RN getting their own version of Wasp Class LHD as the RN only has two full flight decks now? I, when we get to the literal ready group, we will talk about that because I am starting to think that NLHD might well be in the British government's view, in the British Royal Navy's future. <laughs> Hello, Cal. Hello, when do you feel that governments will learn the value of heavy armour and fibers capabilities, especially UK? At the moment, those are expensive things. And the British government is rapidly trying to get rid of expensive armour. But honestly, the reason it's trying to get rid of it is that... Look, the British armed forces... At different times, the different services seem to be actually quite efficient at getting funding. The Royal Air Force peaked probably in about the 1990s. Then they could do no wrong funding-wise, and they would get whatever they wanted. The army did well as long as it had Iraq and Afghanistan to easily point to, but the moment they went, it, was really, it wasn't really in a good position. It's struggling to work out what it's raising debt to and its justification is. And you can tell this because of the sheer amount of buzzwords they keep going between. And the Navy was lucky. They had carrier strike and they had the strategic deterrent. And basically the entire Royal Navy is built around those two things. Plus a bit of anti-submarine warfare and expeditionary with the amphibious warfare, with the amphibious warfare capability. And no one really wants to do expeditionary, but the Royal Navy is able to sell amphibious uh, expeditionary capability as response groups, as it's better to deal with problems when they're small than wait for them to grow big. Then it becomes more expensive. And also, you can use them for disaster relief and those sort of things. So, 
that's the thing. The Royal Navy is managing to come up with quite a good way of selling itself at the moment. If that continues, we'll be quite lucky. But unfortunately, well... Currently, Vice Admiral Jerry Kidd has um, just retired as Fleet Commander. Um, he served till September this year. I'm not sure where he's going to go next. I'm hoping the Navy doesn't lose him because I think he's a very good personality. And him and a few other of the first sea lords we've had in recent years have managed to do a lot for the Navy in terms of giving it a core and a raising that track. And there are younger ones coming up behind them, and there are some very good officers coming up at certain levels. But I do worry about the Royal Navy if it doesn't, it needs to keep this momentum going. <laughs> Carmen, re five inch gun. I've believed for a few months now, um, about as long as I've known enough to believe it. For all destroyers to have two twin turrets and frigates one twin, honestly, that is there is a large chunk of me which would agree with that one. Adfab, to what degree are the army involved in amphibious ops? They used to be dominant. Um, the army has never been dominant in amphibious operations. Uh the uh, honestly the army has and uh, the army was part of amphibious operations but they were never dominant in them uh it was always considered the navy's thing and when the royal marines sort of became a commando and then a division uh, became a brigade and a divisional strength organization and although they weren't used as such during world war ii because they mainly used as the commander in commando roles but when they became post Second World War, a full brigade, the army really stepped back. And you have to remember, technically, under its many, many hats, 5th Brigade was supposed to be an amphibious warfare support brigade, the, the next the next brigade to go through. And um, they had never practiced amphibious warfare. In fact, I seem to remember one report from one officer saying, we didn't even have the manuals. We were a brigade on paper, and we double, really. Monks Posada, how many of these ships today you're looking at today would you consider capital ships? I'd say for their navies, they're all capital ships. But I would say there's a very good reason the Western ones are bigger. Because... Honestly, the Western ones' warships and other ships are bigger. But also, the Western ones are tend to be looking at going further, operating in things like the North Atlantic. And if you're going to operate in the North Atlantic or South Atlantic, you want something quite big. Hence the Dutch vessel we have here. Rather cute. It's the Carol Dorman. Built... Up until uh, Carl Dorman uh, built 2011 to 2014, commissioned in 2015. 27,800 tons. Uh, capability of carrying, of going 9,800 nautical miles at 12 knots or a top speed of 18 knots. Uh, let's see. Has a roughly 150 crew. Can carry roughly uh, has two goalkeepers, two 30 millimeter rapid fire guns, four 12.7 millimeter machine guns, and up to eight 762s. Can carry six NH90s or with Cougar with blades folded or two CH47s. That's Chinooks. With their blade spread, and they have a two spot heli that has a two spot heli deck and hangar for up to six medium helicopters. The ship can accommodate, mm, broadly speaking, 150 personnel, but they have 2,000 lay meters for transport or materials such as tracked and wheel vehicles or containers. 
Um, she also has command rooms, hospital facilities, two surgery rooms, all sorts of things able to reconfigure. She's an excellent asset for the Dutch. Um, Tobias, uh, GR3, the army still does amphibious operations, but usually in river in nature. Yes, they tend to do river operations, and it tends to be the... It, this is the thing. If I was the army, and I was keeping an amphibious warfare capability, my brigade commander for that brigade would be drawn from the Royal Engineers. Every single time, it would be. You know, I would have an informal rule that they have to be a member of the Royal Engineers because, honestly, the Royal Engineers and the Royal Logistics Corps, or the really large corps, um, are the ones who do the vast majority of riverine practice and understanding with the, within the army. And frankly, the RLC, you can't really make one of them a brigade commander. As much as you might want to, you they 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 have too many. They're too useful, and if anyone who which gets the brigadier from the RLC is too critical to running other parts of the arm for of the army. Whereas the engineers, they need a brigade they can go and command, and frankly, that would be a good one for them. <laughs> Carlos, re Singapore endurance class, and it can also visit a bunch of islands. And one can guess where they did. They deployed anti ship missile batteries with a platoon. They might do if they wanted to in operations. Next one Are any LHDs, LPDs built aside from Prestige? They all are. Let's be honest. The Algerian one is its Algerian Navy's flagship, it's its most powerful ship. And in fact, for medium powers, for minor, uh, for minor naval powers, amphibious ships are their critical assets. France maintains one aircraft carrier, but they have multiple Amistrals. And usually some, well, not until recently, usually some LPDs as well. They, they always have the capability around because amphibious warfare matters. That's good. Everyone tends to, uh, Dr. Clark, everyone tends to worry about a name with a lot of military hardware and problematic economy. Dirk Scott looks around at what's going on in the UK at the moment. Uh oh. The UK economically is doing okay, doing fine. In the nicest way, I think it was there was a report that there were going to be shortages at the petrol stations, and because of HGV drivers driving t trucks, and the report I read, which was from BP, said. Of 400 scheduled deliveries, which they had scheduled for that day, only 12 weren't done. And less than half of those were because of a shortage of drivers. The other half were because of other in incidents preventing the trucks getting to the petrol stations. That is not a shortage. There are lots of people squealing and saying it's going to it, it, it's expensive, but it's amazing how the companies are finding the money to pay drivers a lot more money than they used to. They're also having to re get going several of the of the training facilities which have been allowed to languish. How should I say? So yeah, is it going to be tight? Probably. Is it going to be, we're going to be invading France again? Well, doubtful, but... We haven't invaded France in such a long time. The French probably miss us. It's been a long, long time since we last invaded the France. It's just... They miss us. I'm sure they do. No, no. Seriously, no.
to Burst Joe 3, we'll be looking at the Egyptian Mistral Amphibs. I will probably talk about them. How big is that to the Bismarck? It's nowhere near the Bismarck, but it's it's a fairly large vessel for the Algerian Navy. 8,800 tons, so it's roughly the same size as a Crown Colony class cruiser and displacement. In fact, looking at the LPD ships, should they be built to civilian specs and cost as Ocean was meant to be? Remember, let's put it this way. When navies say they're building to civilian cost and specs, there's two options. Either they're actually building civilian cost and specs, or they're building what they call the non-critical areas to civilian cost and specs, where it doesn't matter. But it's very rare that they are built to actually full civilian spot uh, specs. Jack Ray, is there a large percentage of specialized crew amphibious assault ships or other non amphibious types, medical and other roles? Usually do have more medical, etc. and other roles because usually they have the facilities for them. So often they can be used as medical facilities for the rest of the fleet. Rapid Razor, LPDs are extremely versatile, not just amphibious operations, they're useful for all manner of humanitarian ops. A small to mid sized navies could use more of them. They are, and let's be honest, we can talk about the Canberra class, which were really critical to help in Australia in evacuating people who were caught by the fires. <clears throat> I find it mildly amusing to consider the eighties not modern day. I'm sorry, I wasn't born till the end of the eighties. And that's uh, that seems a while back. And uh, um, technically technically by the time you hear me say these words, these words are those words I've said are already history. Because I've said them 30 seconds before you hear them. So, history is any moment in history, any moment in time, the last moment is when history begins. That's got the media, big people think the media does love a bit of hysteria. Well, what I love is the media sets up a double standard. It's first one day it talks about how there's going to be fuel shortages, and the next day it talks about how people are behaving stupidly by queuing at the at the, at the fuel station, at the um, petrol stations. Bias Geoffrey. I like to think amphibs and LPDs are extension of escort carriers of World War II, as, they, as well as playing on the concept of sea control and suicide crisis options. Fair or no? Certainly some of them are. I would say the San Giorgio class are, to an extent. Especially as they've been adapted by other people. Tobias Geoffrey, so you say we're going to give the Franco-British Union a third try. Um, no, nah, probably not. But there again, does, the other option we ever do is, instead of invading France, we go and conquer any rich islands they happen to have in their position. Any parts of France, uh, islands around the Fran uh, are islands around the world belonging to French that are actually worth it? Don't think so at the moment. There again, we have just done an alliance with Australia, so you know. Uh, so, 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 I'm not sure how it is over there, but here in Canada and the States, regs and lack of pay led to a mass dry retirement. I'm glad yours is getting better pay now. Inspiring trigger. Well, they are getting pay, but there were, there, there were some very interesting headlines. And this is completely off topic of history, but it actually makes sense in the moment because um, it's kind of like when small nations are procuring more capable units than you'd necessarily think them. Uh, people were turning around and going, wow, wait, uh, drive, people driving for waitros are getting paid a lot. And there was actually a response for that. That headline can be rewritten as waitro drivers now earn enough they can actually shop in waitros. The thing is, some nations, they might be small in terms of finances, in terms of population and economy, 
but they might decide that, frankly, they have the need of the capability, and therefore they're prepared to spend. And if you're going to spend, you might as well spend on something decent. Otherwise, you just need to replace it in a very short amount of time. That's the thing. Buying something which is more capable than what you need right now is, in essence, a level of free future-proofing. It means, yeah, we've got a level of spare capability above what we need. I would argue that Singapore is a good example of that. They've got four of those vessels. They, You could argue they could have got by with three slightly smaller ones. They've got four slightly larger than they probably needed at now. So that if in 10 years' time they need more, they have it already there. They don't have to do a crash build program. Uh, let's see. I meant the Carl Dorman to Bismarck. Um, Carl Dorman. Uh, well, the Bismarck's mm, 50,000 tons full load. So the Bismarck is roughly... Let's put it this way. The Carl Dorman is a little over half the displacement of the Bismarck. That's what the common barrier for economy was made in a fairly tongue in cheek manner. I know, but I've been dealing with Sony press reports lately. I'm now actually answering, answering, answering these things. Um. I was asking, the pick is a Crusader Mark I landing beach, so some kind of training landing and not a real operation. You'd think that. You would certainly think that. Can I read 1983? Not just look at and just look at the political map of Europe. No two Germanys, no Czechoslovakia, no Yugoslavia, no USSR. I know. The world's changed. <clears throat> I think I prefer it now. Um, of license, what do you think of the steel beach on the Carl Dorman? Well, it works. It does work. I have to admit, They have done. Hmm. How do I put this? Uh, they've put a lot of space into it, but not necessarily a lot of maneuver room. A uh, friend of mine was going into it in a landing craft and frankly was going. <laughs> Because there was already another one in there, and whereas Albion Bulwark, they are slightly, they pro they probably aren't actually that much more roomier. They just feel roomier the way they're designed. It's one of those things. It's an illusion. Oh, for French hands, you just to get the Dutch to build us some islands. Hmm. Sam Thompson, I don't like exactly how do you secure and improve your infrastructure when you have a lack of logistics in material and personnel to the point where one would be employing temporary foreign workers to fix it? You put a lot of effort into education. A lot of effort into education. <laughs> Rapid raise back. In that case, you might want to look up some of the Arsenal ship designs for um, converting San Antonio class hull into a cruiser. That was interesting.
I'm fairly sure I have a picture somewhere. Let me just give me a second to look it up. Let me just get it out. It's always uh, why is it my slides move around? Just annoy me. There we go. Hello, and courtesy of Navy recognition, this was a design uh, put forward by um, Huntington Ingalls, uh, which was their, for their future surface combatant, and it would have, I think, 288 Mark 41 VLS, or 144 Mark 57. Yep, that's a lot of firepower, and yes, that is a lift at the back for the helicopter. And Fab, how many commercial vessels are such are useful designs? The Navy should chuck some cash at them with an ability to call them up, e.g. Roros. Roros, ferries. There are you can actually modify most container ships quite quickly into something practically useful. Practically and pragmatically useful. Do you think USN is too dependent on LCACs? I think that that's the thing they've gone for, and I think the LCAC is a very useful tool. I think at the moment they work very well in a in a benign and controlled environment. I am not sure whether I'd be quite so ecstatic to be on one in a slightly more complicated environment. <laughs> But they also have advantages. You know, they can be far faster than conventional landing craft. Although the French are working, have got a, um, a special, very fast hull uh, design that actually is works quite pretty well. That's good. Ideas for amphibious warfare. Take the Sherman DD concept, but give it to the Navy instead of the Army. A Fletcher class destroyer with tracks. You see, you're joking about this, but I honestly think the tribal class destroyer captains, if they could have got tracks put on their, ta their ships, would have decided to invade Norway. And that would have been a very scary scenario for the Germans. It wouldn't have got any under under any low bridges, though. As you saw, there were pro pro previously the pe first picture up was the classic, in uh, you know, picture of the Falklands. There are troops going ashore. Everyone misses the barve uh, for some reason, which is the beach armored recovery vehicle here, very critical for operations. And there's a few landing craft, uh, a few land rovers, etc., and other things on the landing craft, but mostly it's just getting troops ashore. 
He has a tank. Scorpions sim and scimitars went down to the Falklands. They were useful down there. They wished they had double their number. You know, there is this very curious British perspective, which is that amphibious warfare is this thing which you do with light infantry, and then the armor and the army eventually shows up after they secure things. No, you can integrate armor quite well. <clears throat> oh well. Can we swap out the halo for another 5 inch? When we started on that design. Um, Thomas Edna. Hello, Thomas Edna. Uh, is there a size limit for LSDH at which they become useless? Second, is there a size point at which landing type should be a dock type or a carrier type? Honestly, below eight thousand, below eight thousand tons, probably in modern circumstances, there isn't much you're going to get on it. Uh, but it would seem that you can go up quite large. The Americans have got theirs up to roughly not far off fifty thousand tons. They are mini aircraft carriers, though, in many ways, and most LPDs usually are roughly in the thirty thousand ton range, and the Mistrals, etc. So normally, you, if you're looking at if you're looking at a, let's say, a first-rate power, and when I'm talking about a first-rate power, I'm talking tech terms of capabilities of their individual ships, not in terms of first-rate as in who largest, biggest, most powerful, but someone who's aiming for having a first-rate amphibious capability from a vessel would probably be looking at around the 45,000 tons marks, or, for, well, definitely the for, around the forty to 50,000 ton area. The it might differ depending on the actual specifics of capabilities, but that's the sort of size you're looking at for a second rate or maybe in a first rate navy second tier capability. They're probably looking around about the twenty thousand ton area, um, twenty to thirty thousand ton. And now, a few years ago, these have probably all been down roughly ten thousand, down ten thousand tons, but things have got heavier. Nice way tanks have got heavier. The equipment's gotten heavier. It's got more amounts. You're supposed to take a lot more capability. You do need a lot of capability for amphibious warfare. I sure, Matt. Johnson, has anyone come up with an issue just to hair small limits yet? Uh, not yet. Mainly because there is really a practical limit. And the limitation is you need to get close enough to shore. If you're talking, if you've got a dock, you need to get within viable range of the LCUs of shore you're carrying. Ideally, you do not want these to be in heavy seas. You do not want them to be too far out from shore, and you don't want them to be out for too far, too long, because they are flat bottomed and designed to beach. They are not designed for the for high sea states. So when we're talking about, oh, but you want to keep back, you want to keep out of missile range. Why are you carrying a gun? There, you are very sensible. You're that's a very logical opinion. However, however, he says. You also have the issue that you'd rather, and this is going to sound a little strange, but it's rooted in common sense, I assure you, you need to get close enough for that to operate. And the thing is, you might think, well, yes, it's got a range of 800 miles, so I can stick 400 miles away. That's great, but it's going to take a long, long time to do that at 12 knots. And ideally, you don't want to have to wait that long between putting waves ashore, do you? So you ideally want to have a wave going ashore every 30 minutes. Which means the reality is you're talking about a 12 to 15 minute transit time 
for your landing craft because they're going to have to go, drop off, come back, reload, go back, drop off, come back, and keep repeating that until the ship's empty. So, um, yeah. And then people go, oh, but we have helicopters and they're faster. And you go, well, yes, but is it really the safest or most practical use of thing to have helicopters creep dashing and forwards, back and forwards with infantry? And those infantry are being offloaded from helicopters, but they have no heavy equipment there because it's taking so long for that to get there. And even helicopters are not, ti are not time machines. They're not warp capable. So this is the realities of amphibious operations. You do need to have a measure of pushing the enemy back. You do need to have a measure of fire support and range. And this is one of the reasons why I argue that actually having a 5-inch gun on a LHD is not that bad an idea. Some probably then go, well, they if you they're firing, they can be counter-batteried. And that's true. But if they're firing... They can use their, they, instead of having them firing their guns, you could have them sitting there with their guns and radars, watching, getting the information in, and if artillery starts firing in your location, then they can counter battery that artillery. And the thing is, they'll be moving. It's far easier for a ship to move than a mortar unit to move. Now, of course, though, we also have Iron Man capabilities. So, you know, eventually you might have raw marines flying off their ships like jump jet troopers from Red Alert 2. If you haven't seen the computer game, you're missing out. Actually, it was actually one of the better games of the uh, 1990s. Um, and flying across. That's quite a possible technique, but... Let's be honest, that's going to be enhanced light infantry again. And if anyone remembers when they were using those um, lovely flying troopers, they were great for reconnaissance, but you'd guarantee you'd lose one or two of them. In fact, all of them. Because they, the enemy would have flak or missiles or something else which would take them out. <sighs> Machine guns. Okay, uh, let's see. Hovers are way too fragile, even the small arms. Mm, they are to an extent. Uh, right, well, let's see. Is it true that one of the UK land craft was sunk in the Falklands? Yes, one was sunk in the Falklands. Uh, it was off on its own. It was trying to get some equipment forward for 5th Brigade, and it got caught out and sunk. Come on, we can't uh, container ship mod modification. For, for your information, there is a small ship container ship called uh, Comoran, out of service in two thousand and out of service, albeit out of service twenty twenty. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, the Galahad wasn't a landing uh, wasn't a landing craft. The Galahad was a uh, landing ship logistics, a landing ship, not a landing craft. The difference is rather more semantic than it used to be. Um, honestly, landing ship means they have a covered area for their people to go into, so they're really designed for longer ranges. Whereas landing craft don't normally have covered spaces, but even in World War II, there were some interesting designs which were designated one and actually fit the profile for the other. But as a rule, landing craft can be hoisted aboard a ship, whereas a ship can't be hoisted aboard a craft. Vasilis Viraglus, how, hello, how would the game change when autonomous to uh, torpedo drones become reality? That's basically another version of mine warfare, so it needs to be dealt with.
That that if you have autonomous torpedo drones, they are just a version of a mine, and that's what their most navy is looking at them are treating them as, and they are using their anti mine warfare skills, which do move across. Off license. This twenty five miles standoff range for uh, oper amphibious operations. I'm called. I wouldn't risk a fifty thousand ton ship at a hundred miles from the coast. But for my clock. Um. In which case, we need to start working on our ship to shore connectors. That's the big problem, as you've seen. I, I, you know, this is the latest and greatest in the amphibious movement really going, and that's not really a massively improvement ship to shore connector. And that's the problem which the Americans are approaching and everyone's approaching. And the original idea was hovercraft, and then the French have put in a catamaran and all these things which are faster. Lovely. But the trouble is, do they really increase the time? Because if you think about it, Now, let's say I want to do 150 nautical miles offshore. And I want to uh, I want to cover that in knots. And I want to do that in roughly well, I've got to do that in 15 minutes. Then I'd be talking about a ship uh, having a ship which could do 600 knots. That's not viable. A hundred? That's 400 knots. 50. 200 knots. So how far am I looking if I want to cover 15 knots in 15 minutes? 15 nautical miles in 15 minutes and I'm looking at 60 knots. Well, that's slightly more viable. But honestly, if you want to do your 15 minute maximum of landing landing wave every half hour, which I wouldn't say is the best way to up to get your troops ashore, you're looking at 10 nautical miles. Now, here's the other option, and this is what, the, of course, the British famously did in the Falkland Islands, which is you actually go right into the fricking bay, and you take it down to 0.5 nautical miles, and you can then accomplish that in 15 minutes at 2 knots. That's the reality. The reality is distance is what makes the decision, uh, decision for you, and time and speed of vessels. And as said, the French landing craft Um, they currently use the EDAR, the engine, the the the, the, uh, the engine de debarkment amphibia rapide, which can, has a top speed of thirty knots. Okay, top speed of thirty knots. So. They can therefore, if they want to do their 30 minute turnaround, seven and a half nautical miles, they can sit off. So off license your 25 mile standoff range. Uh, I'm sorry, but that's on a good day because 25 nautical miles To get it done in 15 minutes, I'm looking at 100 knot speed, and that's two and uh, that's over three times faster than the fastest landing craft really practically available. <laughs> uh, 
Reference, I get they aren't as fast and maneuverable. It strikes me amphibious ships would make excellent multi-role warships. Our space makes them very versatile. You just need the right module adapter. True, but then they're not available for amphibious warfare. And you kind of need them for that. Um... Gemma, fast LCUs. Uh, let's go to the LCAC. That's fairly fast. Landing craft air cushion, and that can go 40 plus knots. Honestly, probably roughly around 45 knots if fully loaded. Um, they've apparently got a 70 knots maximum speed. Uh, but, yeah, don't expect that. That's not going to mean that they're at 25, uh, you know. If they're at 25 nautical miles, they still need to be going... If they were doing that 15-minute round trip, uh, 15 minutes, there and back, so they do it every half an hour, they'd have still have to go 100 nautical miles, 100 knots. So... Probably less than 20 if they want to do a 15-minute round trip. <laughs> or rather, a 30-minute round trip. From beach to land, uh, to ship, 15 minutes... Pick up new supply of troops, take them back for a few minutes. You know, that's if it take if you can literally load and offload, boom, done, boom, done. This is the reality of amphibious warfare. This is something I'm sort of I, I wanted to talk about today because so little has changed. This is why I haven't done it traditional style. It, amphibious warfare hasn't changed because honestly, the same things still govern amphibious warfare. It's the pace of movement. You can keep the troops going as quickly as you like, but you can't make them go any faster. You really can't than they are now. So it's as quickly as you like, but they ain't going to go any faster. I want them to go faster. That's fine. You want them to go faster, but they ain't going to go any faster. And it got back to how many ship to shore connectors do you have? How many LCUs? How many hel how many he helicopters? How many this? How many other? how many targets you want? What kind of force are you facing? And the faster you can get your troops ashore, the safer they are. So the other problem is you think about safety of the ship. That matters. But what matters more is the mission. Getting those people ashore. Alfred B228, hello. If they can solve the power problems on LHDs, could their new laser point defenses allow them to better protect themselves from missiles? Yeah. <laughs> Jack Ray, would a railgun system be a decent idea for a close in weapon system for an amphibious ship, like for hypersonic missiles? If they could get it working and shrunk down to the size, it could be quite well. It could work. Probably more likely to be a Gauss gun at that size at current technological pace. See much? How do you imagine the downdraft from one of those giant Russian halos? Love, it, it, it would pick you up and throw you around. It does. Um, I think the U.S. Marines are testing a 1960s James Bond style jetpack for that right now. That was the Royal Marines testing it earlier. I think the US Marines are testing one as well. I think everyone... Uh, there's a very good British design going around that a lot of NATO navies are looking at. <laughs> Let's see. Da -da -da. Jack Wright, it seems that an amphibious assault our area would need something like a railgun AA. Eh, we can always hope, but that's a, not available now, is it? I mean, it might not be available for a while. Um, 
Jack Ray, wouldn't it be good to have different types of shit to shorecraft uh, uh, show because of the differences in shore types and sea states? Yes, that is always good. That's the reason most navies either have the landing craft because they're capable of doing the most sea states, uh, the widest range of sea states, and the widest range of shores. Believe it or not, LCACs are very, very selective in their types of beaches. You need to be very careful about the sloping of your beach for an LCAC. You need to be careful for the sloping of your beach for a landing craft, but honestly, well, if we go back to an earlier, <sighs> this thing, literally, I think in the Falklands War, a adapted Centurion tank hull with a superstructure on it, whose job was to literally, and I mean this quite literally, ram landing craft off the beach if they got stuck. You can't really do that for horror craft because it causes it more damage. And um, you still have Barves beach armoured recovery vehicles. They still exist, and they are still doing exactly the same job they've always done, which pretty much is um, a version of, well... Uh, it, it, I once had it described to me as a rugby scum, a scrum between a tank and a beached whale. And that sort of fits it. The reference, like, given the insanity that was explored during the Cold War, what was about submerged amphibious ships? I think the problem with submerged amphibious ships is you're then building a very, very large submarine if you're going to have anything like enough troops to be able to put in. And I think you're relying on stealth for that submarine survival. You're rely always relying on stealth for a submarine survival. And that is the difference. And that is, uh, there have been lots of predictions of the future of the surface ship is going to be, there's nothing and they're going to go away. And there, I can see the arguments on that. But I honestly, here is the problem stealth is a great tool while you maintain it. If you lose your stealth, you're in trouble. Because you ha if you've put everything into stealth, which is what submarines have to do, then they're only viable as long as that stealth works. Again, something we discussed uh, discuss in this upcoming this next week's um, Bill Trumps. Or rather, the next Bill Trumps, episode 66. Drama, when the French actually last do an amphibious landing, they're always doing various little landings all over the place. Little landings. The British do a lot of little landings as well. And the Americans do a lot of landings. When they the last do one that made the news, um I can't really remember. I think it was there. I think there's one more recent than suppose. But um the, that's the thing. Our four peninsula doesn't make much news, but that was quite a good amphibious operation in Iraq, and the invasion of Afghanistan was very heavily amphibious orientated in that it was ships moving the tri sending troops ashore via helicopter over Pakistan, but they were there. Off license, what about the American light and amphibious warship? It's a bit slow and lightly armoured. It's the Americans attempt to try and figure out how to square a circle. And they're trying to figure out. Alfred B228. Uh, whatever happened to the World War II LSTs? I would think a modern version of them would be handy. Well, that's actually the interesting thing. That's arguably what the light amphibious warship is, and a few other the LCTs, which I haven't really shown, but go around are. Uh, they are still around. There are still a few nations which build them. But the ultimate problem is you are ramming a ship ashore. And in the Falklands War, the British LSLs, like the Galahad and the Tristan and the other sort of knights of the round table, 
all had the capability that they could do it, but no one actually wanted them to do it because they'd survey and the bit of survey information they had on the beaches suggested none of them were really that great for doing it, and they might end up racking their LSL, which they needed for other things, because that's ultimately the problem when you ram a ship ashore. Which is why landing craft are so useful. Peter Dawson, the things on the side on that, yes, they are. If we go back to that picture, there you go. She has got landing craft. In fact, that's perfectly sensible for her to have landing craft. Okay. Nice one. How the Sparta, How much has amphibious warfare changed for all history? Not as much as you'd think it would. It's got faster. It's got heavier. Let's be honest. Tanks are probably easier to get ashore than horses were. They are. Have you ever tried to get a horse in from one big ship onto another little ship? After, sometimes they had the resort to craning the poor things, and they would take taken ashore in rowing boats, for the most part. You know, that, that, that's not really nice for the horse or for the people involved in it. Tanks, you drive them, it tends to be onto a landing craft, they tend to be happy. But the trouble is, they weigh a lot more than a horse does. Mainly because, let's be honest, a tank eats more than a horse does. They truly do. Before anyone says that, that, Alex, you are being facetious and making rude jokes. Think about the fuel bill of running a tank. I know I was joking about buying a T-55 earlier, but think about the fuel bill. Fueling for a tank versus feeding a horse. Which is easier. Um... Don't see how useful would any of these LHDs, LPDs have been in World War II or Gallipoli? Uh, well, if you'd had this thing at Gallipoli, let's be honest, if it's come along with its helicopters and you can actually sustain and support them, then that's probably a lot of the issues with the Turkish positions dealt with because you then have the strategic mobility and your troops can literally fly over the enemy's heads. Uh, with those landing craft, again, they'd be a lot faster, a lot more flexible than the ones used. And her 76mm gun would probably take out quite a lot of the um, various systems that the uh, the Ottomans had. You want to be really cruel? You turn up with one of these things. All that helicopter sustainment. And if the HMAS Canberra of today turned up in Gallipoli, then the Ottomans would have lost within days. The technology difference would be just that massive. It's always it's one of the things I always find it interesting when you look at people go, they go back in time, they're always taking an aircraft carrier or something like that. You want to really change the past? Take an amphibious ship back. Think about the tanks. This thing carries M1A Abrahams. Think about a couple of them turning up in World War II. Yes, you have to manufacture shells and keep that fuel bill paid, but my gum, that's go they're going to get through pretty much everything. 30, uh, 30 Abrahams tanks? Is there anything the ally uh, the anyone has in World War II one that could stop them moving if they wanted to move? Attack helicopters, heli transport helicopters, L LCUs, it's got it all. Carl Gansler, read Gauss versus Real Gansieras. I only use them under one layer of the closed web systems, and also 76 mm can run its own generator. EM accelerator guns need the ship's main power, don't they? Eh, to an extent.
Uh, Thomas Aynor, you're in World War II Normandy landing, landing. You can switch one landing system with a 2000-2001 system, a 2000-2021 system to help the invasion. What do you do? Hmm. What do I do? I can get some of those tarot class with five inch guns. I probably want a whole load of that. I want to replace my largest landing ships with a landing ship infantry with those. I just want to replace them with them. Crown with infantry, but I've got those five inch guns. I've got helicopters. I've got the LCUs. I've got so much stuff that I frankly I can win. I can win D Day without any trouble. Especially as long as the German defenders don't get a, a slight an, a equivalent upgrade. To an extent, Derp Squad, true. Rank Squad, what is the modern incarnation of the LCI? Any good LSMs? Uh, there aren't many good landing ship mediums out there that are really landing ship mediums. Mostly they are caught, they have the smaller range of LPDs. And landing craft infantry, lots of them. So they're called the LCVPs in the British service. And various other navies have their own variants. Um, Knight 6831. Well, today I met um, some lovely people who had actually lost a relative in the loss of Sir Galahad. So losing one is a pretty bad thing for the families back home. But for the Royal Navy, well, <sighs> the Royal Navy had seven um, round table class landing ships and losing one meant they had they were left with six. Oh no they they had um they had six losing one was bad but They still had five left. And honestly, they just were using them as much as they could. Uh, the logic behind them was that they needed some logistic vessels. Was, honestly, it was a Ministry of Destruct Transport ordered them. Um, military supply vessels was their plan uh, to replace the World War II era landing craft tank vessels, which they Mark 8 landing craft tank vessels they had been using prior to that for the duty. They'll soon invent a device like a giant soap with a that will create a pressure wave in front of a missile, causing it to hit it like it was water and explode on contact, safely away from the ship. That'd be nice, but I again haven't seen one actually anywhere working. Or any idea any ideas of how to make it pragmatically work. Um, Rapper is why we looked more at Gauss guns? Probably because the Chinese were looking and we were looking at rail guns. Plus, rail guns are the more perfect solution. Gauss guns are a bit more, um, they're less accurate. Let's put it this way. Knight 6831, how bad was losing two Knight 42 destroyers and having a third damage and two candy class DDDs damage? It wasn't really what you wanted to do, but it's fighting a war, and again, 
you have to design your force around the right, risk of losing stuff. We are starting to go off the amphibious questions here, so at some point I might put up the brew ship sign and declare this brew ships. Because I had a feeling Sunday's uh, Sunday video might end up turning into brew ships. Uh, that's good. Tanks are also better on ships than horses because you don't have to muck out a tank. True, but they can still um, leave little puddles all over the place you have to clean up. That's good. I'm fairly sure that World War One science and the chemistry can make kerosene pure enough for it to be able to run a helicopter engine. Probably. What was the round table class landing ships uh, ship used to uh, suppose uh, supposed to you have replaced? I said the uh, landing craft mark uh, the landing ship tanks mark eight. Jack Ray. Wow, that HMAS Canberra looks quite functional. I'm not sure why, but it's eye pleasing to me. Don't say that in the presence of me or Jamie too much. It's now, that's the best looking look from it. Uh, that's its best angle. Let's just leave it at that. That is by far its best angle. Frank Sarno, uh, Dr. C, so what's your plan, opinion on the San Antonio CGX? If you build that, you build it. That's your new cruiser. Lovely. John Luke, could a tall boy stop an Abraham's? If you manage to hit it with one, yes. Well, let's put it this way. I would stop it or create a hole it probably couldn't get out of. But either way, I don't think you'd hit one that well. I think you'd probably get out of the way before you did. All right, so it's tangentially related, but what about portable self-assembling harbours? Again, we look at those on a regular, semi-regular basis. Different people look at them and the various facilities that they can have and the capabilities that are needed for them. Um, actually, think Defence does have a good role in paperness. You have certain facilities you can put together to put manufacture a temporary harbour. Uh, Britain has the Mexifloat system, which can also could be configured in that fashion, or they could. Uh, there are various other. Systems the army uses, etc., for bridging, which they could actually adapt for that. And you have various. Well, the, one of the things I always find funny is the amount of um, bladder fuel systems the British have that have available and have that they can uh, store that they can use the scenarios, and they can literally store the fuel and make no bones about this. They they intend to sometimes store the fuel in the water. They've announced this part. You know, this has been seen, pictures have been shown on exercise on many occasions, diagrams. And the idea is you stick the fuel bladders that sort of inflate with the fuel in them underneath water, underwater. A, that helps keep the pressure for getting the stuff out, uh, getting the fuel out of them when it needs to be. B, it keeps the fuel cool. And C, it protects them from some of the enemy attacks because, well, is the enemy going to see them if they do a quick flyover? Probably not, because they're going to be below the water. Sean quickly, why does the idea of an amphibious assault trip at make you think that there will soon be a Mel Gibson version of Final Countdown with a happy ending? Oh, please don't go there. Um, that's a Mel Gibson movie for starters. Um, Alfred B228, with all this talk about landing ships, how do you defend against current amphibious capabilities? Mines, artillery, submarines, airstrikes, and an armoured assault on the beachhead. Hey, what topic? Were there any uh, armored piercing high explosive shells used on ships in World War II? I think some people feed, uh, well, some people had high explosive armor piercing rounds, heat rounds. 
but I can't remember who from off the top of my head. As said, I didn't get much sleep last night, so I am running a little bit on the tire bubble, which I apologise for. I hope you don't mind. Uh, Depth Squad, a little puddle from a tank might make someone slip over, but very unlikely to cause an outbreak of DNV on the vessel. Uh, yeah, but it's still annoying. Asuski, you don't need to do track tension on your horse, on the other hand, and without proper tension, you'll lose your track in the biggest patch of mud, uh, and your driver uh, will not like you. Mm. Hello, Piper. Uh, Piper, paper. Hello. Hello, Piper. PA42. It was lovely to meet you today. And yes, I'm at it already. I've been, uh, I was live as on the time I'd scheduled, so 6 30. Uh, and I managed to make it, even though trains try not to. And it was lovely to meet you. And um, I'm glad you managed to finish off the bottle of 1901 before raving under the airport. Because the, the fact that they don't let you fly via brew is just criminal. Criminal. Knight 6831, why did the commando aircraft carrier fall out of use, and why did the UK devise it in the first place? Well, they basically devised the commando aircraft carrier because they needed to justify trying to keep the aircraft carrier. And then the moment the Falklands War happened, uh, Michael Clapp found that his commando carrier was used, being used as a carrier, and he didn't have his commando carrier. So he didn't have any heli he, he didn't have the thing to support his helicopters, which meant the British ended up building what's called an LPH, which is another name for a commando carrier, a landing platform helicopter, and that was HMS Ocean. So that's why the commando aircraft carrier disappears. Because it really is an LPH. Armored assaults on the beachhead. Sounds like a reason to keep tanks around. It is. <clears throat> Uh, defending against current amphibious equipment capabilities, track mounted and a ship missiles are the common option. They are. I would consider that under artillery, though. Uh, look, look, a freak typhoon stands up. HMS Furious and HMS Albion are, are, tra uh, are traded places. How badly taken out is the Japanese force which took out force the Z? Uh, which HMS Albion are we talking about? The modern Albion with the Royal Marines, etc. Sure, or um, the, uh, the you know the uh, Albion from the nineteen fifties, which was an aircraft carrier uh, and could carry jets at one point. So. Honestly, I'd probably uh, probably that Albion would be more useful in that scenario. As much as I love the LPD, it wouldn't be useful in Task Force Z, uh, dealing with Task Force Z. But the Centaur class aircraft carrier, she would have been quite useful. The modern one, um. Well, Furious is gone, so actually they might build their carrier, might try and build carriers more quickly. But honestly, what would Al uh, what would Albion do with her command and control facilities? You would quite possibly see the lovely, the one, the only Admiral Cunningham going aboard, her going yes. Probably has a better radar than pretty much. Everyone else. Um, she carries Phalanx, which... Honestly, Phalanx might shred a few air defense uh, aircraft in the night. Let's be honest, if you manage to get hold of Phalanx and manage to reverse engineer to any degree a Phalanx system, with the help of the crew and, I don't know, all the material manuals they have aboard, you might end up with some fairly ca uh, fairly interesting air engagements, but um, yeah, honestly, Adrian Albion, as much as I love her, not much useful for the Task Force Z. A lot of use if you're doing D-Day and if you're doing Torch and all those operations. Adrian 
HMS Ocean was an LHP. She was an LHD. She didn't have a dock. She only had a helicopter landing facility. So she's an LH. She's an LA, uh, an LPH. Landing platform helicopter. Albion's are LPDs, landing platform docks. Uh, Bay class are LSLs, landing ship logistics, not dock. But they are they do have docks, but they landing ship logistics. And so to replace them, they're probably uh, to replace the Albans, you need LHDs. You're probably looking at that eventually. And Bay class, I'd hope we'd get more like the Bay class. I hope we'd go back up to four though. Phil Williams. Hello, Phil. When I served on the Fearless, they were moving the barb. It slipped, uh, slipped into the dock and rearranged the ramp of an LCM. I was laughing lots. That doesn't surprise me. <laughs> the barb weighs the freaking ton. Oh. No, no. If, has the Chief never done a special episode on about on barbs? Because that would be something cool. Tanks which aren't tanks, although occasionally they do are very interesting. Sorry, so on. Even in peacetime, when no one is looking for a fight, what drives anyone to continue tech advances? Does the development of new tech ever tend to lead some nations to be more willing to fight? It can do feasibly. It can give them a full sense of security, but mostly they usually are defending it because they see others developing new technologies, even civilian technologies, and think about how they could be applicable to war. And there is that old saying, CV passum parabellum. Those who seek peace should prepare for war. And it is a very true saying in many respects. I swear I saw this somewhere, but did landing craft ever take the ramps off or down so that tanks could fire on shore positions before hitting the beach? There were lots of times when artillery was used from landing craft and positioned up, and there are some landing craft which honestly had low enough sides that they could fire over them anyway. Uh, but that doesn't always go that well for the landing craft, because let's be honest, the landing craft's not designed to deal with that amount of force and momentum, and it has a flat bottom. They have a flat bottom. So they don't have the counterbalance that you have of a lovely hull, which will do sort of roll. Theirs is a flat, so if it starts going like this, It'll do like that. And so if you fire, they can do all sorts of interesting things. So usually they don't. Sometimes they lower the bow and they fire as they're coming off, but honestly, they prefer them not to. Because again, when they fire, it tends to push the landing craft back out to sea and it's still trying to come in. Again, not the biggest thing. Not really designed for that. I'm reading a book and pondering the question the British were crazier than the Americans and Australians crazier than the British. Were sailors from Tasmania crazier than the average Australian? Hmm. I have family in Tasmania, so I reserve the right not to answer that question. Although... I will give you this advice if you're in the southern part of Tasmania and you see a group of how do I put this uh, not uh, my cousin so I can say this redheads drinking iron brew because they've managed to get some sent out to them uh, and they're on the south coast and they're together and quite obviously a group of sisters and I'm talking about five of them. I would advise steering a well clear of them because they are they are all very well trained when it comes to the martial arts. And I have no doubt that in a few years 
I could be cheering on a couple of them in Olympics. In which case, even if they are against the British girl, they will, I will probably be training. I will probably be cheering my cousins. Family has to trump at some point. That's got deconstructing on retro cannon. Bombers would suddenly get much better defensive firepower. Well. Honestly, the um, ships would. I'm not sure about bombers. Maybe. Rubber is it? Why are cruisers use soft as command ships? Because they have the space, and because they can get close enough to the target, and because they are not so big. Let's be honest. If you try to command from a battleship, every time it blows its artillery, it's Fires its prince its main battery, you're gonna have your radios shake themselves half to death. Um a cruiser is far more sensible. And they often had the flagship quarters, uh, quarters and all the communication systems and all the facilities to deal with the extra staff. For example, if you're aboard HMS Belfast today, you will see the Admiral's quarters. Nine six eight three one. Have you ever heard of the Vickers 1983 Light Fleet aircraft carrier? Yes, I think I have. I've seen a couple of different weird designs though for it, so I'm not sure if I've seen a, the actual design of it. Next one. What is the history of invasion fears in the UK? This seems to have picked up in the 1800s. Uh, basically, every time France looks like they're getting organised, we get an invasion fear. Occasionally, it's when the Spanish look like they're getting organised, and once it's been when the Germans were organised. But we weren't really as worried about them as we use it in the press. And in the press, it was a good motivator for the public. Alfred B228. Could the anti air cruiser make an idea as a comeback as an anti missile cruiser to protect landing ships? Honestly, that's what cruisers and most escorts, these uh, destroyers, etc., and above these days are about. It's a lot of anti air firepower. If my medics can be armed to protect themselves and their patients, can hospital ships be armed with. with with CIWS, it's not an offensive weapon. It's an interesting thing which has actually been debated as we speak and has been debated many times. I would argue that a hospital ship should be allowed to have close in weapon systems. CIWS. Um, principally from the perspective of missiles don't care. Missiles don't see you transmitting uh, your, uh, don't see your hospital ship, don't see the big red, uh, red cross. And yes, there are arguments that oh well, they should be they should be broadcasting on open frequency and all these things. They should be, and you know you keep them away from. But accidents happen, and missiles, considering the ranges they're fired at these days, accidents could happen quite badly. So if you're looking at hypersonic missiles, especially, the engagement time is not going to be that long. They make a mistake. How long are you going to have to notice it? So. Um... I think they should be allowed it, but... Hmm. Night 6831. I have been wondering why the plan Sager's hood refit weren't finished when she got sunk, because they had a refit plan for 1942. Probably because they were still being revised to take in advance... Uh, take in, uh, Advances in latest technology, so some things they were leaving unfinished until they worked them out. I, how much electricity does she need? Where are they going to put the radars? What radars are going to fit? All those things come in. And what's the latest? The haze mayor and other systems of development. The four and a half inch. Are they going to have enough four and a half inches for it? Should they go five point two five? There are lots of different things that they are considering, and it takes time. What ship is that? It looks pretty, and it would like like it would be good for presence. It is very good for presence. It's a um, San Giorgio class of the Italian Navy. They're possibly my favourite of the little LPDs, and <clears throat> honestly, if I was building a Bay class replacement for the Royal Navy, I would probably be taking at least a good chunk of my idea from this design. 
96831. I've seen the British submarines of the Cold War book in local Waterstones. It's going to be up. The review's going to be up at some point this week. Or is it already up? I think the review for that one might be up. Let me just check that one. Do -do -do -do. Flick through. Da -da -da -da. Studio. So, I, I have literally just met, mentioned Red Alert, and now I'm already getting advertised to in my YouTube channel. I'm not in my channel, but in my YouTube sort of like, the endings for Red Alert. No, it's coming up this week. It's not out yet. Da -da -da -ding. Does God, there were landing craft with rocket batteries on a D-Day. Does that work better due to the redu a reduction in the recoil transferred into the ship compared to cannon bombardment would? Yes, it does. Device Jeffrey, as long as the brew doesn't run out, you're possibly safe as long as the brew doesn't run out. Um, Drank Spider, Dr. C, have you ever seen the Space Marine Force idea? Rockets delivering troops. There's always an idea. Um, Rastrowski, so Tasmanian Devils? Again, they're cut their relatives. I'm being nice. Actually, no, I should be very, very nice. I think they uh, about six of these shirts have been ordered into Tasmania, so I'm fairly sure I know who's ordered them and why one person has ordered six of them. So I'm fairly sure I'm going to be getting a Christmas card of them all to, uh, wearing uh, of them all wearing them. Have you read Chris Gibson's books on the unbuilt projects of the British aerospace industry? I have a copy of it somewhere to read. It was sent to me to review by someone. I don't think it was sent by a publisher. I think it was sent by someone else for me to review. Um, yep, uh, that's good. The other reason to fly the Admiral's flag from the cruiser is that it's less likely to be a primary target in a battle. Um, no, people tend to be quite happy to kill cruisers. See, when you are perfectly correct, if you can, Ireland, the French actually did invade a couple of times. Um, well, Wales, Ireland a couple of times, and uh, one of the Louis invaded during the time of King John. So, and of course, there's, we always say the Norman invasion, because they are Vikings who set, settled in northern France and were called Norsemen of Normandy. Uh, but let's be honest, they are, by that point, also French lords. So, um, yeah. A few times. Rapparazer, I think I'm being sent British subs to Cobble for you. you you're going to like it. Don Giovanni, how about point defense missiles on hospital ships? That's probably slightly more of a stretch because that creates more of a bubble. But it does depend on how fast the hypersonics get. I suppose. Um, Rapperizer, was the Axis Chief start and they were staff when you got the Japanese officers of summer just sent? All I can think of was Liam Nason. I, I don't have a ship, but I, I do have a, a, a very particular set of skills. I cannot rec as I've said many times, I can't recommend any other book other than this because this is the only one on this topic, and I think it's quite good. But there are lots of people who are prepared to critique it, but no one else has managed to write anything equivalent to it, so good luck. It's my fur definitely of the ones it's full of the information here which frankly you would not get elsewhere. It's not a reading reading book, but it is definitely Well, it explains all the various high command structure, the ranks. Uh, 
and their roles and what they were. And it's just, it's like this. You have a full command diagram for the Japanese Imperial Naval Staff in here. And that's just something which I'm actually at some point going to have to delve into. I'm going to do more about the Japanese and all. Based on this book, purely this book itself will allow me to probably produce uh, about a dozen or so videos. I'm sure more than just the Chief of Staff ones. It's an absolutely exceptionally interesting book. No, Scott, knew someone who was on a frigate in 91 Gulf War escorting hospital ship. Cannon said, if it comes to it, the frigate will position itself between hospital ship and missiles and take the hit. Sounds pretty much like what the frigates do. Darius Rosatsky, welcome to the YouTube logarithms, like I say. I know, they've been there for a while. Um, Hmm. Uh, Calvin Gasberg. I uh, like replacing the four Bay class 16,000 ton ships with six St. George class with 12,000 ton. I was thinking more um, six St. George class of about 18,000 tons modeled on a sort of enhanced version. of this and my literal reason for this is quite simple is when i'm looking at this sort of commando forces deployment and all those things i'm thinking well if we had enhanced versions of this which had their hangar facility and had their uh, well let's put it this way instead of having a had a hangar slash flex deck capability as well as a dock and um, and another sort of storage facility down the deck below, in front of the dock, and those sort of things, and the ability to carry landing craft on davits, but also had guns and some missiles, then suddenly your shortage of frigates and crews, uh, frigates and destroyers becomes a lot less of a problem, because if you have a couple of these with an LHD, then... The LHD might have F-35s and other fixed-wing assets of it. That's fine. These will provide its point defense in terms of missiles and some ex uh, some guns to help with the closing weapon, uh, help with the protect uh, the task group sort of protection, along with uh, Type 30, a couple of Type 31s, and then it's. Well, if you're going to attack this group, you'll need to actually send something major, in which case we respond to something major, which is a carrier battle group with some Type 83s and Type 26s. Going, hello. And then if you got bigger than that, well, we have to hope the Americans come along. <laughs> yeah, Darius, you always have to remember my little cousins tend to watch especially the Sunday one. Which, uh, so we're talking up until about 9.30, I always try and keep make sure it stays very nice and polite. And even later, because occasionally they watch later, especially during COVID, they've been watching later. And that's my little cousins, the ones... Who are who? Although I might think they might have knowledge, their mums get very upset if they think they're learning such knowledge from my chat. So Sean is being very kind to me and saving me from getting familial earache. I do realise about mm, a good dozen of my viewers are probably family, possibly two dozen. on the live streams. Yeah. 
Prank Spider, did the French ever invade the Americas? Well, they had Quebec, they had various islands in the Caribbean, and they had Louisiana, hence its purchase. Sure, Matt, not yet. I haven't played any Grand Tactician the Civil War. Come on, uh, yeah, hospital ships and cloak missile COS. Yeah, so most syntaxes. Sea Sparrows and ESSMs are put into target. Yeah. Sean Quigley, with the hypersonics, is, is fragmentation expected to take down or just blast over pressure expected to disrupt the flight path and make it tumble and overstress, uh, overstress the destruction? Ah, uh, a mixture of the two. If you can do anything which can disrupt its flight pattern, you are probably going to take out a hypersonic. It's going so fast, it, any damage is going to cause a, a lot of damage. Yeah, well, Stafford, you have to remember, Drac is a civil engineer. Anyway, I'm going to flash something up because I think... I'm not sure about everyone else, and I will do a thing, but I'm going to say it's now brew ships till the end, okay? So it's now brew ships. And did it did it. Right then, let's go for just sorting this out quickly. It's 120, And if anyone wants what I'm doing quickly, I'm quickly putting in, because it's necessary, the timestamps for things. To do, necessary to do it while I remember, basically. There you go. Now it's a time stamped away. All right. So let's go to the questions. Um, Night six eight three one. How would the Suez Crisis have gone if the Royal Navy had a multi class CV along with a single audacious class CV and two century and cluster class CVLs they had historically? Uh, even quicker than it did. That's the thing. Honestly, the uh, the thing is the Suez the Suez Crisis is pretty much militarily won. It's dip lost diplomatically. Paul Westwick, for the Iron, I would like a double Italian Trieste class to replace Alvin Wog. Something along the lines of the Trieste class would probably be good. A little bit bigger, maybe. Uh, Calvin Westwick, uh, recent George of San Giorgio weight gain. And even the basic model would need like two uh, uh, 2,000 tons more to make it uh, uh, viable from north to south Atlantic and anything in between. Pretty much. Seem which smarter diplomats would have been better than more ships. Uh, honestly, a mixture of two. In fact, the British diplomats in the uh, Falklands and in the Suez Crisis were both fairly on point and knew exactly what was going on. It's the governments which made the issues. And it was successive governments on both. 
Hello, Kalgazu. Thank you very much. I have no idea what a thousand half means, but thank you. I'm, I'm, it's a super chat, and it's always very nice when super chats appear. Honestly, super chats are iron brew and <laughs> iron brew book and uh, takeaway money. Oh, running on takeaway, Ah. Besides all cousins, there are even sailors who might learn in decent words. That's true. They might. They they might. I doubt it. They might. Um, Knight six eight three one. How similar is the Russian carry Kuznetsov situation to what I trans victorious found himself in the nineteen sixties? Uh, victorious honestly was probably in a better condition than Kuznetsov. Kuznetsov needs a lot of work. The Russians need to be very, very... Uh, that that poor ship, no. They just need to replace her. They need to let her go. They probably will do. Um, one of the interesting things that when I was considering doing about this, and I was considering talking more just about LHDs, but I realized they haven't really changed much in this time. They haven't in the, since the 1980s. There have been more of them, but, you know, there haven't been that much. Um, the Russian Project 23900 amphibious assault ships are the interesting ones, and they're the ones which, when they come in, will probably, uh, they've both been laid down, they're both under construction moments, there's the Ivan Roganov and the Mithrofen Mosolenko, uh, which are technically supposed to commission in 2026 and 2027. They were laid down in 2020, and they're 40,000 tons. And I think once those come into service, then people, then the U.S., uh, then a Russia might start building another, about might start building a new carrier, and B, they might let Kuznetsov Kuznets um, have a quiet snooze somewhere. I think the reason they do put so much effort into maintaining her is because they know regenerating a carrier capability is far more difficult than maintaining one. And therefore their idea is if they keep it going, then at least they have something. And they're not regenerating from scratch, but it's still incredibly... It's Kuznetsov. It's incredibly... If it's... <sighs> Ivan Hello, Clark. It was a pleasure meeting you today. I hope you. Uh, to, uh, I hope you'll be happy to hear. I've just gotten on my train. My viewer, who, I, uh, who asked me to specifically ask you about Agincourt, is very intrigued by what it is. Well, as said, I'm going to be looking at that, and I'm hoping on the second of October to be, if everything goes to plan, to be joined by um, a special guest to discuss the what if what if ships and go through them. Grosowski, if we ever get to meet in a pub, will that be brew ships? That will be brew ships, yes. If we're meeting in a pub, that'll be brew ships. Although I'll be on the iron brew still. Rapper Rosa, why don't we just build tactical jets to the naval specs for all services? It strikes me as the reinforced air frames and land grid would aid in longevity. They would, but they'd also increase the cost a lot. Next one up. Do you still want to go over to San Antonio LPDs? I can do if you want me to. That's good. What do you think happened to MV Estonia? Well, that's an interesting question. MV Estonia was sunk, of course, in 1994 between Sweden's Åland and Finland and Estonia. And it claimed 852 people. An official report, of course, concludes the bow door had separated from the vessel, um, pulling the ramper jar. It was already in a poor condition, apparently due to poor cargo distribution, 
and this uh, was this was then made worse by the water coming in which flooded the decks and cabins and shortly after power failed and search and rescue was inhibited by this and a full scale emergency was not declared for 90 minutes this all led to only 138 being rescued the report focusing on the passive attitude apparently passive attitude of the crew Failing to notice, apparently, that the water was entering the vehicle deck, delaying the alarm, and providing minimal guidance from the bridge. I have to say... It's always been one of those incidents I have... A bit of a worry over a quite so many people died and b now as of 2020 they have the uh, the Swe uh, swedes have managed to do new underwater equipment uh, equipment to film the wreck and they found a four meter hole in the ship's hull Now, here's the question. Did they hit a submarine? We don't know. We, we honestly, we, do, we don't know that, they, you know, and we don't know whose submarine they would have hit yeah, if they had hit one, so we don't know that. Presumably, if in Western nation or etc., they would have omitted it, but there again, they might not have, but honestly, it would have probably come out from the crew by now. And the same again with the Russians. It's something would have probably come out by now, especially with what has happened. And especially as when it was sunk, when the sinking takes place in 1994, the Russians, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, uh, there's a period between when, they, when Russia gets far more open in the late 1990s, early 2000s. And, okay, not much more open, but open enough. So I'm not sure I agree that the how do I put it the Russians as submarines sunk them. I do think the hole is interesting. I do wonder if that had been leaking water. In. There is part of me which wonders if the end came quicker than we assumed. I'm wondering if they weren't actually improperly loaded, as has been assumed, but water, there was a slow leak through the hole. And this is me entirely supposing from the information I have available and I've been able to gle I've gleaned from various documents and reading of the So it's entirely my own conjecture. And it's definitely not a thorough investigation. But as I've been asked the question, and as I'm a maritime historian and as I've talked about incidents in the past, you are going from a maritime history and naval history background. I would suggest that maybe if the hole had happened earlier, and that's why she looks like she's improperly loaded, because she's listing already because of the water coming in, and that could slowly reach a point, especially if the pumps weren't working on. Now, the question is, I don't... The, I, the description of the crew, I'm not sure I agree with. Um, uh, the crew might well have been trying to come across as calm to the passengers while dealing with the situation. The crew might not have realized how bad the situation was. It sounds to me like it went down rather quickly at the end. That's what I'm thinking. In that, so the crew might have been going around trying to calm people because they have a slow list and they're trying to manage it, trying to manage it. And then the water reaches a point at which it overwhelms the door. Overwhelms a seal. Maybe there's an old seal. And that fails. And then water's gushing in the door as well. And then the two combined. And the water already in the ship create momentum and take it down or something. But the thing is, honestly, you need a new report. And honestly, you need a full investigation. And with all the latest information we have available now. To try and get to the bottom of it. Because mainly, I don't like the idea it's all blamed on the crew as Carrera. It seems to me... 
if you're saying the crew are being passive, you're saying are all of the crew are being passive, and that seems wrong because the crew you're talking are a large number of people. Um, if I remember correctly, she could carry over a thousand people in berths. She had. A couple of uh, two, a couple of two thousand passengers, four hundred and eighty other cars and vehicles. So you are probably talking at least two hundred odd crew. In a nice way, if you're claiming that she's sinking and they're all being passive when there's two hundred crew aboard, then that seems a bit wrong. I doubt there are. Anyway, kill a binful. It was lovely to meet you. Reverend, like, modern town class cruiser strikes me as a very useful something for the RN. A modern cruiser will be quite useful. That's I'm hoping what the Type 83 will be. Um, Knight 6831. The Invincible class CVRs were supposed to be a class of six ships, and had the RN got the other three, what would you have called them? Indefatigable. Indomitable. Um, what's the other one? Probably either formidable or Victoria. So we got you got Ark Royal as one of them. So or no, or possibly you'd have got uh, you'd have got one after the monarch. You'd have got an HMS Queen Elizabeth. You could well have had that, but I reckon as you had illustrious and invincible, you would have probably seen indomitable, maybe implacable and indefatigable. So. Maybe it'd be indomitable, implacable, and indefatigable. But, you know, that's probably... So, because then you'd have illustrious, invincible, indomitable, implacable, indefatigable, and arc royal. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, Frank Spotter, Dr. C, imagine if the Italians had had time to build DDs in response to the tribals and light crews in response to the towns. Now imagine what they, uh, what they could have looked like. Enjoy. They could have looked pretty. But honestly, they would have probably been massacred at still at some point, because if they're managing to build those, imagine what the RN builds in response. Night six eight three one. Why did the U.S. answering? Uh, uh, so, uh, why did the U.S. Uh, severing IJM supply lines with submarines work, while the German navy's attempt to the U.K. didn't? Uh, the IJN were a lot less prepared for esco convoy, escort, amphibious war and anti-submarine warfare than the British. The British have a lot more um, supplies organic to the United Kingdom. A lot more supplies in there. A lot more farmland, especially. And a lot more industry, and more importantly than pretty much all of that, the British concentrated on the convoy war to an extent that the Japanese couldn't. 
you have to remember for Britain there is a tra there is a strategic difficulty that they're basically having to fight three different wars at the same time. They're having to fight a war in Mediterranean against the Italians. They're having to fight a war in the Far East against the Japanese and a war in the Atlantic and Europe against the Germans. But there is an advantage to having to fight three different wars. The ships you need for them are very different. The fleets you need for them are very different. So eh, they can afford to have escorts and con convoys running willy-nilly across the Atlantic because they don't have to have the battle fleet running around the Atlantic fighting major fleet battles in the Atlantic. Let's be honest, in World War II, what are the big battles in the Atlantic? Sinking the Bismarck? That's not a big battle. It's annoying. It's Denmark Strait and other, and other scenarios, but that's one battleship. Graf's uh, sinking a Battle of River Plate? That's one German heavy cruiser. Honestly, you know, if you want to talk about big battles for the Royal Navy in World War II, we talk about Operation Pedestal. We talk about the resupply, uh, resupplies of Malta. We talk about the battles in the Mediterranean. We don't talk once about the ones in the Battle Atlantic because the Germans couldn't put a fleet out. That was a big battle fleet. So they didn't have to. Whereas the Japanese have to worry about both things. In the same ocean, at the same time. And they haven't prepared for it. Any anywhere near the level the British have. And I don't I'm not saying the British were in any way super prepared. That's never my claim. My claim is the British knew what they were doing to get prepared and had worked it out. They weren't prepared in time because they were preparing for a war in 1942, 43, 44. And um, they're fighting the war in 1939, so they would have just ordered the stuff, but they have ordered it. The Japanese haven't. And they haven't got any facility to order it really from anywhere. It's uh, free euros for the Iron Brew Fund. Thank you. That's still that's very nice. One. <laughs> Hungarian Florence. They work on Florence. But well, Florence sounds like such a lovely culture and um, currency to use. I must visit Hungary and use these Florence. Oh, nice. Uh, don't take this the wrong way, but Euros always sounds to me like there's someone's having a football competition. Free Euros. You're having free football competitions? Oh, no, that's the money. Sorry. Uh, but, you know, Florence, that sounds like cool or quite cool. Opinion on Admiral Cochran. Um, the random ideas at the right time in the weird places. See, anyway, so diplomatic fails the same way either way. Yes, but one where in one you can you can just blame it on the uh, diplomats. The other one you have to admit is the government, which ultimately are chosen by the people in a democracy. Declorin and um, uh, Decl um, DC Nolan ninety five. Uh, Doxy, any chance you can do a vid exclusively on the uh, mountain Arctic warfare cattle the wrong ways? I'd love to, and I would love to. I have to say, it's long been an ambition to go and do a chat with them because they are some really special and clever people. Some really cool people. I know a lot of them. And I have met with them. It's going to sound strange. Do a recorded chat, something I can put on video. Um, even before I did a channel, because of the stuff I do in recording history, because of the stuff they get up to. I'm a big believer in doing interviews with veterans, etc., and putting that all together and making it open for an access for people so that there are people who, uh, so that you have this, you don't lose this history. You don't lose the real way things were done. Uh, kill them, Binful. Odd that all the funding seems to be going to refitting the Kirills while the Snetsov just suffers. Mainly because, let's be honest, the Kuznetsov hull is far less likely to work. Uh, uh, so, honestly, it's far more practical to put the money into the Kirovs. And they're big, scary. They're far more scary and far more easy to keep up operational. Um, Knight 6831. I don't get how Admiral Kuznetsov hasn't been sent to the Breakers yard. 
that's just that's literally it's the um russian persistence uh when you're that's good when your aircraft carrier needs two ocean going rescue tugs in the fleet because she's more likely to suffer a serious breakdown than crew crews than not you've got problems yes Frank Spotter, can you do a history on royal yachts and other nations too? I would, I'm going to do that. That actually is one of my to-do projects. I have to-do projects. Yes, I do. Um, Knight 6831, the CVA-1 class carrier is too slow and weak to launch F4s and bucks. How do you fix that? Uh, probably the engines that they would have been built with would have been slightly more powerful than... One of the things I find with CVA-1 is there's a lot of discussions about what they're supposed to be, but they were never actually built. And the thing is, if they've been going to have F4s and Buccaneers, um, you the, the weakness is based mainly in the catapults they're planning on fitting. And seeing as they got the audacious ones up to it, they probably could have upgraded them. And remember, when a CVA one's first being planned and put together, they're just only just then looking at adopting the Buccaneer, the F4s. So honestly, she'd probably been adopted. As for the slow part... Well, again, I take the speed for the CVA-1 with a pinch of salt. All it's listed. I, I, I do take it with a bit of a pinch of salt, because, again, my dad and a couple of his friends worked on that project, and they all thought that she'd be a lot far. Uh, they all thought that um, if they'd fitted the engines as they were supposed to, and the way they were supposed to, uh, uh, she would have be been getting at least eight more knots than they were listing her as. True to bias geo free. It can be tracked from uh, miles away by a submarine. Um, see when electric silent Vistol aircraft bringing in troops low from over the horizon. They're building flying cows for cities. They can make them for the military. How expensive are the flying cabs? And uh, let's put it this way: if you can get it to work, sounds that sounds great. Saltwater environment, troops. Can they carry enough weight? Remember, moving a, ta a, a taxi, moving people, just individuals, going back forward, is probably relatively rot light compared to what you're talking about moving for troops. And how many of them can you fit on your sh uh, ship? How many troops can they carry? How much equipment can they carry? All these things start to become a factor, and it's usually why aircraft end up growing. It would be. Uh, Cruiser Companions of the Type 34s would be interesting. Yes, it would be, Rapper Resolute. Like... Um, I don't... F I, I, honestly, Greg Stassi, I don't think she's... Uh, that the Kuznetsov is um, a smokescreen for more stealthy Russian movements. She could be, but I think it's more a case of she uh, means Mer Russia still has a carrier. I understand why people like what ifs, but history has so much cool stuff that actually happened that nobody talks about. I think that what ifs take up too much historical discussion. Thoughts? Um, well, that's like I, I tend to consider what ifs useful if they illuminate something that really does happen. For example, the I tend the what if I tend to talk about most. Well, the three what ifs I tend to talk about most are HMS Argentor because she was actually ordered. And then cancelled. So it's less of a what if than a route not gone. Operation C, because the aircraft were ready to launch, the search aircraft was in the air, and but for getting a bearing wrong, writing down the uh, the wrong bearing, they would have actually pro uh, they would have launched the strike. And. The other what if I tend to use and I tend to refer back to uh, is pretty much around the Falklands War and CVA-01 is, you know, do you have a fleet carrying service? The thing is, real history is always better for giving, me, uh, for giving you illumination of events and understanding of their contacts. What ifs tend to be useful for illustrating, here, uh, illustrating a capability and explaining what you might have had if you'd had in that situation what you could have done. So explaining things like these grand strategic decisions and the realities of the decision making. You're making a short-term decision to save money. You're making a short-term decision based on this strategic situation. 
but you're, that means you're ignoring this other strategic situation, and that is the balance you have to take. It's teaching, teaching people about risk management more often than not. Knight uh, S6831, Alt History. The Royal Navy builds all 12 upholders, but in the post Cold War, keeps four upholders and sends four to Canada and Australia, and replacement is needed. What would the RN choose as a replacement? Um, they might have justified building more SSNs, but if they have designed, if they have managed to get it to the 12 upholders, and Canada's got four, and Australia's got four. They might well be building, and they might, especially as it's going to sound strange, but that might affect the Collins class build. The Australians still probably would have ended up building the Collins class, and might have ended up operating them alongside it. But then it might be well the case of a joint Commonwealth SSK program has come in to replace the upholders. Let's put it this way. It would be interesting to see what would happen. Remember, what class type of gunboat was HMS Jackal? The 1880s version. Ah, well, that's an interesting question. <laughs> Now, originally, she's a Victor, uh, she's a Victor fishery protection vessel, purchased in 1885 as HMS Woodcock, and then renamed to Jackal. There doesn't seem to be much information around about her. I'd say she's a tugboat, judging by the looks of the pictures and the various things I can find. Originally called HMS Woodcock. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Yeah. I'd say... I'd say she's a variation of a tugboat, but there's honestly, there's a very grainy and absolutely terrible description and picture of her, but it's in German, which is always helpful. Hmm. Have to go a bit digging a bit more. I was asking about Estonia. I think what uh, Dirk Scott is talking about is about is the theory about internal explosion. Swedes admitted to previously smuggling weapons, but denied doing so on this one. Uh, that would be a very big noise, which everyone would have heard. A small collision probably would be less likely to be heard. It would just have been a thump, and they probably thought it was a big wave. Uh, Night 6831, in the wake of the Australian SSK disaster, should France have made a testbed sub to build experience in converting an SSN to design to the SSK? Ah, uh, they that couldn't have hurt. Actually having a ship that they could point to rather than a theoretical plan which just keeps getting more expensive and less and less of it built in Australia would have probably helped. Hello Cascadian, 
And that was actually that's just a conspiracy theory. I think that's referring to the um, explosives, uh, the Swedish explosives. Come on, inflexible, invincible, invincible's already built. Inflexible, maybe uh, for the um, last uh, invincible class. I represent the French dust stuff over submarines confusing me. This is a dispute between a government and a business, not two governments. As far as the French are not being, as, as for the French not being included in the US, uh, you get uh, AUKUS. That's different. Thoughts? Honestly, I can understand the French not being included. I have great respect for the French, but the French often are shameless about pursuing their own third way foreign policy. And the thing is, if you're building an integrated engineering and development project, then do you want key components of whatever you're constructing to suddenly be denied to you, i.e. their replacements, because that country's decided it's not pursuing the same foreign policy as you? And, and that's one of the issues. Like it, or, uh, like it or not, Britain, America, Australia, to a large extent Canada and New Zealand, in fact, all those five as a rule, the Anglo, uh, what some people refer to as the Anglosphere, do tend to, when one of them goes to war, tend to be all there supporting it. Uh, yes, there's the Suez Crisis where there's a famous issue we're not, but as a rule, more often than not, when one gets involved in the scrap, the others find a way into it. Yes, the Brits and the Canadians didn't come and do land operations in Vietnam, but they certainly did operations in the North Atlantic and in other areas to free up American forces to go and support Vietnam. And so there is often a sort of a... Um, a, a, a grouping there between the five eyes powers and these things so it's i can understand why they're not they are in many ways created for themselves a more natural partnership come as intrepid even well the trouble is there was already a ship named intrepid in service at the time that's got blaming a vessel or sinking on the crew strikes me like blaming a plane crash on pilots. The systems are so weak that this can happen. The people who designed the system share the fault. And also, to an extent, the people who hired the crew, because if the entire crew is so passive, that suggests everyone is passive, the captain's passive, the whole crew are passive. Hmm. Invincible, because that worked before. We'd already named one of them Invincible. Kenrick Johnson, is there a chance, final possibility of HS Dreadnought becoming a museum boat because she's the first British nuclear powered submarine? There is always a possibility they are looking into a submarine and trying to put a submarine into a um into one of the, the uh, one uh, into a museum. I think they are actually working on the project. But I'm not sure if they've actually uh, actually got it realistically to the point which they can do it. I know you love the Wildcat more than Hellcat, but do you think I love the Bearcat? I love the Hellcat more than the Wildcat. Um, what do you think of the Bearcat? Lovely, the Bearcat, but the Hellcat's my favourite. Sorry, Hellcat. Um, Frank Swanner, what was the UK response to the Italian very light cruisers they built later in the war? Uh, well, the Italians' very light cruisers were literally being built prior to World War II. They didn't really have much of a cruiser pro construction program once World War II began. Uh, they didn't really have much of a construction program once World War II began. The British response was usually the heavier destroyers. Honestly, they the heavier destroyers, but they also had the Arafusias around to go, Hello! Um, hello! Occasionally, Dido's would turn up and go, Hello! Sometimes they say really scary, a town class or Amphion class would turn up and go, Howdy! Um, I 
I think the Royal Navy has is doing one. Um, they have got a nuclear submarine, I think. Not sure. It's a there I think there is supposed to be one coming. But I I, I I've seen discussions of it certainly. Um HMS Courageous um, is going to be preserved. She's a nuclear one, uh, so probably not HMS Dreadnought. Um, and she's being she's conserved in Devonport Naval Heritage Center, and she's Churchill class nuclear submarine from 1970. And of course, she was involved in, of course, the Falklands War. So yes, we do have a nuclear sub available, HMS Courageous, to go and wander around. I knew there was one, I just couldn't remember which one for the life of me. It's time. 0320. <laughs> right. <sighs> Frank Spider, the biggest battle in the Atlantic was the Casablanca between uh, was that Casablanca between US and the French. Hmm, possibly. Did the Allied A uh, Bud Guy eight eight two nine? Hello, Bud Guy. Did the Allied ASW ships still carry depth charges and hedgehogs when they started to get the early homing torpedoes? Yes, they did. Because it took a while to get the uh, homing torpedoes into service and working to uh, working to practice. So they tended to have things like squid and then later on limbo, which were improved ASW mortars, and they still carry depth charges to this day for helicopters. Darius Rosatsky, Rizat, Hungarian Florence, Florence, not Florence, Florence. Still quite cool sounding. Rosatsky, uh, with a, sw a sub smashing down, it would depend on what part of the snub hit it. It was one, let's say it was the periscope or something like that. It might have caused trouble. Hmm. Rosa, Operation Pedestal versus Resupply Malta, a risk of provoking wreck. There were many operations which resupplied Malta. Pedestal is probably the most famous. So yes, they are the same things, it's, but it's, that's a key example of the convoy battles that most people know. There were more convoy battles than that. Thank you, Rick Gustavo. Uh, forget visiting the museum ship. You and Jack should visit here and go to the iron brew factory. We keep planning that. Uh, planning that.
Feraline, hello, Feraline, hello. Just joined the stream. Back in '93, I bought a group, the Abraham Lincoln's UBG, linked up with the 24 MEUs so, uh, off the coast of Canary. It was impressive to see those shuttle ships. They're very. That was a very impressive force. Reverend, I understand you're a maritime specialist, but with a degree in something as broad as war studies, have you considered branching out? Still love the content, though. Uh, the, uh, the, you do just a, uh, though, uh, though, uh, and do you just a thought? Um, I do tend to wander in. I, I, I do, as you know, have done a castle series, and there are a few other things I'm planning on wandering into. And no, sorry, uh, not sure how, but a wood loss has made it into my office. Admittedly, I do have wood on the outside here, but it's supposed to keep them away. Uh huh. I'm going to have to seal this office, aren't I, with more paint on the outside and inside. Ah, well. Sorry. Not letting that get anywhere near books. Why didn't Australia have their own subs in World War II? I. Uh. Ran submarine arm. I think one or two. Um, they did have submarines. They didn't have many, but they did have submarines in World War Two. They mainly ex the former British ones. And mostly they served in the Royal Navy. So, that was it. Andy to PWR. Hello. Have you spoken about Fields in Trevor, the Royal Navy's first post bit of salt ship, uh, salt ships? My father served on both. Yes, I have mentioned them, but to be today, it wasn't... It's so mostly focusing on the ones since 1980s, and the trouble is, Fearless and Trevor are very much pre 1980s. Um, Come on, your opinion on returning submarine deck gun in some form as an economical sort of weapon to sink low value targets? No. No, no, no. <laughs> you want to keep submarines as far away from the surface as you physically can. What engine? A 968 um, uh, 3 1. What engines are CVA 1? Well, that's the interesting question. Their engines are supposed to be Admiralty Parson bo Admiralty boilers with three Parson steam uh, turbines, providing one hundred thirty-five thousand shaft horsepower to the three shafts, um, and a top speed of thirty knots. But I think it would have been thirty plus knots for starters, and I think they might well have got a bit more out because remember these are yes they're steam units, but they're quite powerful steam units. And they are planned with an air group of 18 Phantoms, 18 Buccaneers, uh, four Gannet AEWs, although I think those would have been evolved into um, E2Cs myself, four Sea Kings, and two Wessexes with another Gannet Cod. And I wouldn't be surprised if that all evolved into roughly eight Sea Kings at some point. Cunningham made many comments about ships, and sometimes it's those comments are he didn't like this ship. Sometimes his comments are that he did like the ships. Honestly, he provided a lot of reports on his ships. He pointed out their weaknesses and their strengths. And yes, one of the strengths he did point a weakness he pointed out was that with their target with their hangers they were big target uh, they were they had uh, their hangers were big targets from the air. But that was frankly not that much of a problem compared to the rest of the ship considering the ship was pretty massive. Thomas, uh, and, uh, if, if, if Jackie Fisher got Adrian's comparable built, what will he do next? I'll probably want to build something even bigger. Cool. 
cool to hear about the Bufok class damage. Um, Knight6831, was it a mistake to cancel Lightweight Seawolf and the Fire and Forget Seawolf? Probably. Both would have been interesting technological stepping stones. Um, most important sailors, not commanders, that you can think of from World War I and World War II. Honestly, individual sailors, as important as they probably are to their ships, tend to be not that important as the war, as the whole fleet, as the whole force. If you're talking about in, if you're talking about influential people, you're talking tend to be about ship captains and commanders, uh, or you know lieutenants and something like that, because they are the ones who make the decisions that will have larger ramifications. Just a bit of fun. Where in the UK did RN uh, where in the UK did RN land an occupying force? Um, the RN have never landed technically. Oh, well, oh, hang on. There have been a few interesting points. It depends how far you're going back. If you're talking about the various operations of the Navy under Cromwell, or the Navy under the Henry VIII, and etc., and various things in Scotland. Uh, there have been interesting scenarios in Northern Ireland where I think it was Fearless dropped off some uh, uh, engineering vehicles to remove barricades for them. All sorts of interesting random things have happened at different points. Are there things SSKs can do better than SSNs? Sit quietly. Let's see. Cascadian, any good books on Dutch navies in World War II? Um, there weren't any Dutch carrier plans really for prior to World War II. They were focusing on the battle cruisers. Maybe after they'd done them, they'd have got some carriers. And good books on Dutch involvement in World War II. There is one, but I can't remember off the top of my head. I've got it in my bedroom. Because I only got it recently. So I'll look it up and put it up on a book called Duke Review. I do watch Battleship New Jersey's YouTube channel. I'm not always up to date on it, as I've been doing a lot of recording and working on myself recently, but when I get the chance to chat up, I'd like to. Great, yeah, honey. I can ask if she was involved in an incident where I was born, along with Atrus Banta, Mantra and Old Atrus. And I can't find a pick either. I asked you. My thanks. Uh, basically, it seems there's almost better Germans also around than English ones. Ben uh, Grogan, hello. Sorry, half message. There, how many Rero sea lift will be needed uh, need to be presaged from Ferries Act for realistic Hong Kong evacuation if there were signs of upcoming hostilities? Uh, if you were trying to evacuate Hong Kong or something like that, you would need as many as you could get and even more. Um... And I mean that literally, you would need as many as you could get, because it would have to be in one go. And you'd still leave people behind. Alright, so that's luck. Your thesis on interview interwar carried with them has inspired me to explore military confrontations outside of declared war, but I'm having trouble getting started in any good places to look. The trouble is, people don't tend to write much or record much about stuff outside of war, because it's contentious, and it doesn't sell money. It doesn't, it doesn't make money. In bookshops, because there weren't aren't usually a lot of people interested in this as a war. Next one, Dusty. Would you say that you need to see uh, that? Uh, would you say that you need to see that would make you confident that no war would, would take place in terms of military hardware? What would you say that you need to see? You can never be confident. No, I'm sorry. There's always a chance. 
Um, Rapper is like, if you turn a nuclear powered ship into a museum, it strikes me the first thing you would do is make it not nuclear powered. It would be a security nightmare if you didn't. No, I uh, still wish that the actual HMS Courageous is going, is part of the museum. They are working out how to do her, how to put her in, and uh, yeah. Um, yep, she is. She is the centerpiece of the museum, or rather, to be the museum, the centerpiece to be of the museum. Uh, it's under development, and it's mm, not going to open for a while yet. Well, properly. They can take people on tours, they go through her, but at the moment they are limited in how many people they can take on her at any one time. Can't think why we're covered. You can't really cut a hole in the side of a nuclear submarine. Steve, uh, at certain points, don't take this wrong, you have said no one would do it, then you've said no one's allowed to not only allowed to wander in, and now you're have said they are allowing them in two compartments. I, I I do understand that you are you are very much part of the competition and jumping in, and I support that and agree with that. But I think maybe if, uh, this is something which I'm just going to say because I said it and then you countered and all these things. It doesn't always look that good if you uh, and I speak this from experience. Of watching students do it all the time. Check sometimes before you jump in, unless you're sure. It's something I have to always remember to do myself because I'm a lecturer and I'm so used to being confident and presenting. Sometimes I will say, and then I'll think, "Hang on, how sure am I of what I just said?" And it's it it gives you more confidence. But it also gives it uh, makes it less for other people. If you keep having to come up and then go, actually no, I meant that, and actually no, I meant that, because it could have been left that as I said earlier. She's the centre of it. She is a museum ship, and people are allowed around her. And the moment it's two compartments, they're planning on upgrading it to six compartments, and they're getting down the whole ship in time. But they're having to work out how they're going to manage the reactor space and withdraw the reactor. So that's going to take time. But they do have a nuclear submarine open for people to view and go around. And it was courageous that um, it was no, it was courageous that sank the Brawl Grana, I think. Remember? No, that was Conqueror. And um, courageous was um, part of the Argentinian tale. Hmm. I think Conqueror. There was a different. There was an issue with the reactor, so they couldn't preserve her. I seem to remember something like that. Nick Waters, could they make a nuke sub safe without dropping off the entire stern off? Probably. But it wouldn't be easy or cheap. Who had the single most powerful force of submarines in history? Probably the US. 96831. In regards to the disappearance of NM Serkov, what kind of design flaws might have sunk her? Oh, so many of them. So, so many of them. Um. If I'm going to guess, though, I'm probably going to guess one of her very many seals and very, very carefully needed to be maintained seals on the gun system would have gone. Paul Westwick, given the Type 31 has no 30 mm to fit it and the decision appears to be made to not fit 30 mm to create fast, do you think we might uh, get the 40 mm uh, T31 fitted to the Type 26 Batch 2? I think you might end up getting it fitted across the fleet because the 40mm seems to be the upgrade option.
Similar. As far as nuke carriers, the US Navy has said in a statement they wouldn't let any be museum ships, probably because it would cost too much money to completely remove reactors without permanent assembly. Pretty much. Hello, Melanie. Modern ships, uh, Dope Squad, modern ships still carry metally very small depth charges for signaling a submarine to surface if it refuses. One ship's horn is blown to tell them that, uh, tell it that it's been spotted. Hmm. Uh, to Cascadian, any chance of collab with my sub, uh, with, say, sub briefs? We'll have some history on the various no nations, uh, submarine developments. I'd never say no to collaborating with anyone who wants to put out some uh, interesting naval history. I'm always happy to help with naval, putting out naval history. I'm always in, in, keen to encourage anyone to come and study naval history. Because I think you can learn a lot from it. Andy Pierre, I was talking to a friend last night. He was on HMS Bristol. Was on HMS Bristol, which is part of the CBA One project. Yep, they were going to be the escorts, the Type Eighty Twos, and now we're talking about building the Type Eighty Threes. So last time we got the escort, but no carriers to escort. This time we're getting the we've got the carriers, and hopefully we're going to get the escorts on them. Um, but guy, how soon do you see the Australians getting SNs? Had to watch the video where the USNCO for it will be a decade before they got one. It depends how they go about it. If they're going just for the ones they're building at home, that could well be a decade. However, if they go for two rented Los Angeles class ones, or some of the older ones, um, that might work for a few years. Add in order possibly two astutes, because there isn't any slack in the Virginia production line, and we all know how Congress doesn't like selling hulls. Um, they always have an issue with that. And you modify the shoot to American combat systems, etc. And that could get them going with the four, and that could see them in service, and then they could start to have their own construction at home going. So that, I've, I've been over that pretty much. Night 6831. I can't see incomparable surviving the Washington Naval Treaty. Hmm. You never know. Honestly, they got hood through. And I think the trouble is, it's far easier to stop ships that are being built than to say to a navy, you know what, that really new thing you've got, that's the pride of your fleet, you've got to get rid of. So I think that would affect the treaties. Right, I'm going to say I'm finishing off my the iron brew I've got. And then that's going to be it for the evening, because it is now quarter past ten, and I don't want to be going too late in the house. And I think at some point this week, I'm going to have to fit in painting. Or at least hunting to make sure I find where the woodlouse came in. Keen on them. The wood's all treated, so they shouldn't have chewed in. So that means it's probably somewhere it's got a gap big enough for it to crawl in. What's coming from that end, though? So it's just, it might be the other office. Mm hmm. Right then. Frank's mother, how many boilers did Hood have? That's an interesting question. That is really an interesting question. Uh, she had. Twenty four boilers. How do we need to run, be lit and run to achieve various speeds? Uh, you probably want at least four going together moving, and if you wanted full speed, well, you need all of them. But you could probably run her quite comfortably at a cruising speed on about half. Bud Guy Titan, besides uh, maybe Fort Drum, did any US or Canadian shore batteries, uh, batteries engage enemy ships or submarines in either World War I or World War II? I'm not sure about the Canadians. Um, potentially Oregon, Steve, but, uh, I 
let's put it this way. I'm very impressed that uh, I, I know they got down to sort of the San Francisco area. Mm, getting to Oregon is quite po is quite possible, but it's uh, it's a long trek for the Canadian uh, for the Japanese to get there. A long way. Hmm. Cool. Uh, three officers need a code to storm their nuclear torpedo. Killing the XO wouldn't have helped the CEO and the uh, political officer launch the nuclear tip torpedo. No, that's uh, they have various issues. Um. See, which only the two can afford compartments are open to the public. I used to live around there and remember that it was not open to the public. I was wrong because now two compartments are open. Yes, Steve. Um, Steel's gone Gunson. What is being spoken about? Uh, that was about the Sukhoff, the French, uh, the French gunnery submarine. Frank Smith, Doctor C, when would you count the USN as the most powerful submarine force? Probably at the moment, and they're probably at it at the moment, and probably have been for a while. And they definitely have. Whilst the 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 Russians tend to have, the Soviets tend to have more. The American submarine fleet to this day, at this moment is probably the most powerful submarine force the world has ever seen, at the moment. Doctor C, could you do a go with the discussion of Barham? Maybe frame by frame. I have many questions about what we could see, uh, what we see when she sinks. Uh, that will be a uh, that will be another video. But yeah, I'll put that on the list. So you think if one of the officers were dead, they could not find nukes? Not a good plan. There are many not good plans. Um... For the Soviets, they, as I said, they have security things in place to try and prevent people firing things which they shouldn't. Um, right, so the officer who was talking about the Australian SNN was also try trying to, uh, to de ruffle French feathers. Hmm, probably. I know you live in the UK, but have you thought about doing more videos on Australia, Canada, New Zealand, the ships and activities? Rosa, yes, I am going to. Rob Rosa, what's a woodlouse? Oh, um... Well, it's dead and crushed now, but basically it's something that uh, usually lives outside the UK, and it looks like, um... How do I describe it? An insect version of an armadillo. It's basically a little insect. Uh, Sean Quigley, any idea where I could find the loadouts for LSTs at Gold Beach on June 6th? My fiance's granddaughter was on LST, LST 287. Would like to be able to tell her exactly what unit they brought into the beach. Whew. National Archives has the D-Day landing records, and I think some of them have been digitalized, so you might want to start, start with checking their website. Take care of it, Casella. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Santon, do you have a smoke machine or one to borrow? Would be the easiest way to find the gap. My professors hate it when smoking was banned on planes. They'd walk around with a, a sig checking, uh, checking draft. Um, I have a similar system that I used to check. I have to admit, I do have... I, I have some... Candles which give off coloured smoke, so I tend to use one of them if I have to check for holes in things. I have a, a little store of them hidden in our garage. I don't know if you can still buy them, but I, I, I bought a couple of boxes a few years ago when they were still available. So they're staying. They, they, they got, I use them very sparingly because they're quite useful. 
Right, sorry, what is a good example of how much more powerful Tribal's 4.5 over Fletcher's 5 is? Tribal's were 4.7s um, to the Fletcher's 5, and it's, it's, sure it's the rate of fire they have from the guns. Let's see, I said that because I knew you would re repeat it word for word. I did. I, I, I always try to be fair when people are sending their comments to make sure I repeat them so that people who are watching know what the comments I'm talking about are. I consider it a nice thing. But I do also sometimes edit the comments. Uh, it's literally rate of fire in the tribals. Not buying it. I bet they could fire. Uh, see, Winch, and I bet not firing. I bet they could fire a nuke torpedo if one of the three were dead. Um, it would be difficult, but not impossible, because there's a line of succession, and because once properly installed, someone can do the things. It's difficult. Thanks for that. How thick of a seaplane fighters? Could uh, you have a BB cruiser with a lot of seaplane fighters to help provide cap? No. They're not really that great. Uh, Stuckland95, what do you think about putting the 5 inch on Type 26 versus the 4.5 inch on, on most of our other ships? We've stopped really building the 4.5 inch, so we're only really the option to have, is to buy the 5 inch. Because we don't want to keep supply. We, do, we don't want to be the sole supporting authority for the 4.5 anymore. It's, it's becoming expensive. And so we're moving to the five, which everyone else is on. Uh, would I, and thank you, Graham Hound. That is a trick I had forgotten about, but I do remember my dad taught me the same thing. I don't like the WD. Wood lasses don't like WD forty. Stafford, no, they are candles. <laughs> Frank, I, I, I've just got my office sort of running the way I want it to, in the nicest way. I was like, I'm not doing that. Not doing. Uh, not the. Uh, they might get rid of the bugs, but it caused me a lot of more problems. Frank Spanner, if Exeter and York are not built, what may be in their place when they go into the fights? Uh, probably other county class, and probably if they weren't built, other county class would have been. You've probably seen more of the regular county class built. At least one more of them. Ooh, he does sound like he had an interesting, part of, uh, interesting war, Sean. With the uh, na uh, naval part of the Rhine crossing as well. Mm. Right. I don't know. Mm hmm. Um. Oh yeah. Oh good lord. Next one, how are those the counties done their places? Um, quite possibly better. 
Certainly not any worse. Certainly not any worse. Let's be honest, Exeter, it would probably have been called Exeter and York They would have, if they'd been built. And they would have probably been upgraded versions of the last batch of counties. So probably been perfectly useful ships like the rest of the counties were. Just imagine Exeter with slightly higher speed and another another double another pair of eight inch guns firing on the Graf Bay. That's probably gonna do do the, the, the more damage, even more damage to the Graf Bay. Um, instead of the guy at the back fire uh, commanding one turret and firing from on top of it. Uh, and directing it that way, he might well have been directing two turrets. So he might have got double the hits. Um, it's th that that's the thing. You know, that they'd have probably been just as useful. And then fighting the Japanese again, but slightly faster and more eight-inch guns. Probably wouldn't have made a difference to the overall thing, but you know, might have got a bit more damage in. Is there a good starter book on Singtown? There isn't a good book on there isn't a book on that at all. That's entirely pieced together from primary sources and a bit from Edward Ashmore's book, uh, Battle on the Breeze, which is his um autobiography. Australians found an interesting primary source on the Royal Navy fighting the Russians in 1809. Did not know much about that before. The Royal Navy likes to fight a lot of people. Calm goes with. How much the Type 206 modernist subs owe to World War II one U boat, a UB 11 class? Any manufacturing subs on the 700 tons now at size nowadays? Um. I think there are a fair number of people looking at it, but mainly when they're manufacturing submarines on the 700 tons. They are talking about extra large undersea unaccrued vehicles. Duckland 95. Uh, getting to the future system weapons. How long do you think it'll be until we can put a coil rail guns on our ships? Until we either make the ships all nuclear powered or we work out the power issues. We need to get far better at our uh, power storage and power generation and the cyclic power generation, especially. Frank Spider, what may have been the worst trade decisions that led to war? I think selling the Argentinians' exosets probably by the French probably counts as a pretty bad one for the Falklands War. Um, but. Trade decisions rarely lead themselves directly to war. Imposing imposing sanctions and restrictions on trade tends to be more of something which leads to war. Trading doesn't tend to lead to war. Although, let's be honest, the fact that France trades so much with Germany prior to World War II is probably not a good thing for them. Uh, Uh, Ayajima, Masada, Monte Cassino, what other mountain forts were famous last stands? Sheesh. Oof. Well, I have to say I haven't got an extensive knowledge in my head of mountain forts used as last stands, but I'm fairly, uh, there's part of, one of me remembering a story from my days when I was doing research on Japanese samurai and their history, because I was just enjoying those books for a couple of years when I was about 11. And I know they had a fair number of mountain castles, which were their uh, last stand points occasionally. That was usually where they sort of small bands of samurai would disappear off to and defend until they were either wiped out or they managed to get revenge or something. Um... As for the rest, 
Well, mountains are fairly defensible positions. Most interesting ones probably are some of the mountain fights in Vietnam War. And really, the mountains turn into a very, very dangerous area for the Americans and the French in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Knight 6831, did any of the treaty powers in the Australian Negative Treaty actually try to demand Atreus would be scrapped? Nope. This is the thing, as I said in the book on the, the video on the cru Japanese cruisers, which actually, if I was able to visit Japan, I would be actually writing, attempted to write a book about their cruiser design. Because I think it could put a good one together right now. They, um, one of the things that they sort of, they really don't do in the Washington Naval Treaty is they acknowledge it's going to be a level of cheating. They are trying to hold... They aren't trying to make a stricter. They're trying to keep it... How do I put it? They're trying to keep the cheating within a certain level of degree... Uh, within a certain degree. So that people don't ha build up what are considered unspare fair advantages which force a runaway arms races. Runaway naval races. But it's one of the interesting things, as I've said many times... When World War One happens, the naval race is actually over. And everyone knows this, even in 1920s. The arms race had been over. So what the Washington Naval Treaty is about is about avoiding another arms race, another naval arms race, which they think could happen between America and Britain. And mainly, that's because the American government doesn't want to pay for it, and the British government are just going, well, if we don't have to, that's great. We can concentrate on paying for other things, like paying down our debt faster than we need to, and, other, and um, supporting the various initial startings of a welfare state. Graham, another interesting the fun stream. It's always well thought out and balanced. Thank you. Casaras, the era of Portuguese expansion might count as trade leading to war. Let's be honest, the uh, Opium War, as Doctor 95 has pointed out, is also there. But there's also the fact that they, oh, let's be honest, uh, let's be honest, most of the British Empire went first the traders turn up, then the missionaries, and then the soldiers, because someone kills a missionary or a trader, and they complain. And then the soldiers get called up. Night 6 room. did any other side see HMS Hood as a threat? They all did. This was the world's largest surface raider. It was a battle cruiser, but let's be honest, there was nothing else quite like it in the world. It was the most modern warship of its available at the time. It was fast. It had a lot of 15-inch uh, guns. It's a scary-looking ship. Uh, the Indian few? Yes. That's the most famous one of the Vietnamese mountain battles. As Graham Harland says, I doubt the UK would have listened or the treaties would have happened. But basically, if the RN Britain wasn't involved, the treaties weren't worth the paper they're written on, and therefore if it's a no-go a, a no go issue for the British, then it wasn't going to be part of the treaties. <sighs> Colin Cameron, thank you. If you do eventually go to Japan, I found Lufthansa was the most comfortable airline to do so. Uh, so. Um, probably it will be them or... I do have friends who do a lot of flying for Emirates, but I think then I'd have to go... I'd have to do a connecting flight. 
And so I probably wouldn't do that. I'd probably want a direct flight if I was going to Japan from the UK. But honestly, if I went to that part of the world, that side of the world, and I didn't go and visit Jamie as well, I would probably end up getting hunted down by an Australian who would be very upset for me. So I'd have to go to, I'd have to do Australia and Japan as well. So that'd be expensive, but could be fun. I've been, Rapido's back. I've become suspicious of historical movies. Consider them always to be Hollywood in uh, Hollywood infused, and you'll be fine. That means they are a far smaller cast than were really involved, so people get duties which they never would have normally had, and a far more artistic budget than uh, the artistic line than normally happened and usually there's a romance added in which no one no one really actually had the time the energy or anything to actually have such a significant romantic liaison I, I am going to not get involved in the discussion on Midway, Rapid Race Back. I'm not falling for that one. It will end up with me, and uh, it will end up with... If I say one thing, I'll end up with a very interesting 1am phone call from Drac going, Why did you say that? The, that movie is terrible. And I'll go, How? Uh, you, you called me at 1am. Uh, or if I say, no, get, do enough, uh, go a different uh, other way, I... I, I well, I wouldn't get a phone call from uh, Jamie. I'd probably just see the explosion from this side of the world. Actually, you know that they'll be both. Uh, both would agree if I said anything nice about Midway, and I wouldn't say anything nice about Midway. Honestly, yes, it got people into history, which is lovely. But there is some historical inaccuracy in movies I can forgive, and there is Midway where it, it's not so much the history I can't forgive as the bad filmmaking. Even if it's a Russian May movie, it still is Hollywood infused. It's basically that's a codicil I use for all movies. They have the cinematic fa uh, the cinematic perspective infused into them. Right then, I'm going to say thank you very much to everyone for being here. Um, it has been a little over four hours long, and I'm afraid I have been awake since about 4 a.m. this morning, thanks to a puppy. And I've been up and down to London when I haven't travelled on trains in months, years even. So I am going to say thank you very much. I'm going to say good night. Can I answer the last couple of questions, and then I'm going to go, okay? Because I'm tired. <laughs> I want to see my bed. I haven't seen it. <laughs> uh, I, I haven't seen it in a, a long, long time. It feels it's it, it, it's technically eighteen hours, but it feels a lot longer considering one of those trains went through Croydon. No, both those trains went through Croydon. But the small the train this morning was fun. I had Drac and me go on the same train from Croydon to uh, London. That was lovely. The train back was absolutely teeming with people who were. Uh, Nicest way, mostly it seemed insane. Because most of the carriage was empty, yet they kept grouping up around me. I'm sort of going, there's COVID going on. Why are you all sitting on top of me? Did I mention the Adriatic this time? I'm sure you must have done. M35 Benefits. Oh, good. This is still going. Sorry, I had to step away and install some stuff. Don't worry. I said just answering the last questions and then finishing off. Um, Common Cameron, would you consider doing a vid comparing the old and new Das Boot for Historic Galaxy? I would. 
Uh, sure, Mac. Midway should be given, uh, would be more forgivable if I cared about any of the characters. Mm, even Woody Allen wasn't up to his normal standard. Good night, Greg Sarsley. Thank you. The bug guy in at night. Night. Uh, thank you, Frank Sosfaro. Thank you, uh, Infinity Five Bennett. Thank you, everyone, for subscribing. Thank you, everyone, for sharing. Thank you, everyone, for liking. Thank you very much for the super chats. Thank you for everyone who's joined Patreon and voting at the moment because voting is live for the patron choice for October. And thank you very much, everyone, who's just helping me try and reach that 13,000 subscribers. Thank you. Graham Handler, you mean tourists. No, I mean passengers on the train. Thank you, Nick Walters. Take care, Sean, quickly. Thank you. Night six. Uh, night, uh, thank you, night nine, the six eight three one. <laughs> you did that on purpose. Uh, Woody Allen. Oh, oh, what was his name? Midway movie. I I'm getting this wrong. This is why I should go to bed. Um. Woody Harrelson. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Night Duckland 95. Night Melody 640. Night Graham Handler. See, well, your rack is calling. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Take care and sleep well. And there is. Uh, oh, this is where I should announce them. The recorded the video the long patrol for this week, which is going to be all the comment responses for the Chiefs of Star series, are uh, starts coming out tomorrow, and there's going to be one Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Mm hmm. There we go. Hmm, that's weird, really weird. Thank you, my turn. Really, Melanie? No, not Aaron. Thank you. Take care. Thank <laughs> you.